we are still very much in a late cycle economy. I think the Fed keeps rate higher for longer until they get a recession. High for long will still be an important part of the narrative. We're going back to 2%. The Fed is absolutely capable of getting us there. I think the worries are going to come for next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's try and get you to the weekend. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. What a week again in this bond market. Your 10-year, higher the session, 499.20. TK this week alone, up 33 basis points. This week alone, history made. There's going to be a lot of study of this. I think I predict you're going to see it over the weekend. How do we go back? Where do we go back to? Maybe we go back to 1870. There was a real panic there. Maybe we go back to the Napoleonic War. But the summation of John 3, four weeks of movement, is history-making. Within one basis point of 5% on a 10-year, a little bit earlier on. Need to look at the curve as well, just how things have evolved. The two-year versus the 10-year, the shape of the yield curve, that was negative 110 basis points earlier this spring. Bramo yesterday, a break of 20. That, to me, was what I looked at, this fact that it's uh, really kind of moved in the opposite direction of what people thought. They thought the long end earlier this year would move down to where the front end was, or the front end would actually move down to where the long end was, and you would get a flatter, lower curve. It has been the opposite. And yesterday, Fed Chair Jay Powell said, it doesn't seem to be inflation. It's something else. And it doesn't seem like we're overly restrictive, but there seems to be a fear that is not really within their control. So what do you do? Drum roll, you proceed carefully exactly. into November. <laughs> so November's no longer a live meeting, correct? That's sort of what people are pricing into the market, but still there is a chance of a, another rate hike this year. I don't know whether that matters. I think it's telling that the long end still sold off. You saw yields go higher after that speech. Tells me something. Policy is not too tight. Is that the right quote from yep. Chairman Power, David Weston? Policy is not too tight. Yeah, well, it's getting restrictive, and the answer is on the Bloomberg. We actually look at the numbers to three decimal points. Not the data check, John, but there we are off of Powell. We are restrictive. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, Goldman Sachs with a nice index, too, negative 0.2. We have moved from accommodative into some form of statistical restriction. And this equity market struggled this week, to be clear. Equities poised to snap a two-week winning streak on the S&P 500, right now negative by 0.2%. Let's whip through the price action together. Crude heading towards a second week of gains. Back into the 90s, WTI $90.70. WTI crude, Bramo, up by 1.45%. So we get the last of Fed speak before the quiet period today. The last gasp. Fed speakers today include Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker at 9 a.m. and Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester at 12.15 p.m. I'm curious if they reiterate this idea that it's clear that perhaps we're not overly restrictive, but also that they're seeing wage gains really wane. And that was something else that I thought was interesting from Jay Powell yesterday. At 12 p.m., this is going to be potentially <clears throat> contentious. President Biden is meeting with European Council President Charles Michel and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen it is the second U.S. EU uh, summit since President Biden took office. But this comes at a time of incredible divisions, even within these two stalwart allies, particularly around steel. And I'm just curious how that dovetails into some of the war conversations. And today, in terms of earnings, I'm actually more interested in the regional bank earnings right now, John, than I am in some of the big banks. And we hear from some of the bigger names that have had trouble. Bank of California, which acquired PacWest, aftermarket Western Alliance. We deal with Comerica uh, Huntington and a whole host of right. others. To me, does this give a clearer read in the pain you've seen in yes. regional banks yes. on the U.S. Perfect. economy? than anything that we saw to the bigger banks. I totally agree with that. I think I've never said what you just said before. You're right. Uh, the answer is this is a huge, huge deal. And what's really interesting to me is not now, but I want to go out three months. What is it, the first week of February, whatever? Sure. That's going to be sport. I'm totally with Lisa. This week, what was the lesson? Bank of America is not the bank of America. Correct, based Absolutely. on what we heard from Brian Moynihan. Well said. They do not cater to the average well American. They also are not necessarily leveraged to the same kind of pressures. And, oh, yeah, they basically have free money that they can then use for other things. They might have parked it in treasuries, which is a problem. But that's not a luxury that a lot of these regionals have. Busy morning going into the weekend. Your equity market negative 0.2%. We begin with our top story. The president addressing the nation. I know these conflicts can seem far away. And it's natural to ask, why does this matter to America? Hamas and Putin represent different threats, but they share this in common. 
They both want to completely annihilate a neighboring democracy, completely annihilate it. A rare 15-minute Oval Office address set in the stage for a formal request that Congress provide $100 billion in resources. The team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Ollie Crook in Tel Aviv. Morning, Ollie. Yeah, John, that's right. And that is sort of the big news here in Israel as well. That request um, from Biden, we understand more than $100 billion, but most of it going to Ukraine. So I think the question for Israelis will be the question for Biden today, which can you get this through Congress? We understand that $60 billion of it is for Ukraine, $14 billion for um, Israelis and Israeli defense, and then $10 billion for the humanitarian aid. And again, we heard from Biden again in the speech last night, as we heard from him in Tel Aviv, cautioning Israel about how they proceed in this, mentioning 9-11, but also speaking speaking about the Palestinians, saying that just because Hamas has held this attack, it does not forfeit the right that the Palestinians have to be live freely and to right. live without danger. That being said, 14 days into this, the aid has still not crossed. Oliver, I am absolutely thunderstruck on a Friday by the lack of military discussion. We talked to a Screaming Eagle yesterday of the 101st Airborne. We talked to a Marine of Fallujah. What are the military people telling you, the media in Tel Aviv? Well, let's have that discussion now. The mood music, we should say, on the Friday is also a day that Hamas has called for another day of rage across the Islamic world, which last week when we saw thousands took to the streets. Overnight, we've had more strikes in Gaza, more strikes in Lebanon, and we've had the Israelis evacuate more people from the, uh, the Lebanese border. The United States also intercepting uh, cruise missiles and drones, we understand, fired from Yemen towards Israel. There is the small matter of a huge country that sits between uh, Yemen and Israel, and that is Saudi Arabia, which is where our attention turns also to the weekend, where we understand there will be a peace summit held in Cairo. The details are still fluid and sketchy, but we understand from our reporting that Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, will be in attendance. So too the President of Turkey and representatives from the EU Foreign Ministry as well. Again, maybe a second crack at the diplomacy that failed earlier in the week with Biden. Based on the fact that there have been all of these diplomatic talks, do we have a better understanding of why there has not been some sort of ground invasion about whether there is a feeling within Israel trying to uh, perhaps uh, have some restraint to not flame some of these fires? So I think this is a very difficult question to answer, but I think that Bloomberg has done some very interesting uh, reporting on this overnight. So again, reading the tea leaves, what have we heard from the Israelis? Yesterday, the defense minister, he spoke to his troops. He said that very soon you will see what Gaza looks like from the inside. That's what we heard from them. However, as we know, the rhetoric around what this military incursion will take has shifted. And the question is, how much influence has the United States had in terms of shaping that and potentially delaying it? In our reporting, according to Israeli officials, Officials. We understand that the U.S. is much more involved in these kinds of discussions with the Israelis than it ever has been in the past with an interest, one, in reducing civilian casualties to the maximum point, but also in the question of what next, the after Hamas conversation. The United States is still very much in that conversation. Ali, great work as always, buddy. We'll catch up with you a little bit later this morning. Every single morning this week, we've had two objectives, to try and work out the potential for a broader conflict in the region, one, and two, to try and get an update on the humanitarian crisis that is very quickly materializing. The US and Europe are still pushing to open humanitarian aid into the territory, and yet, what do we see, Bramo? The Rafa border crossing between Egypt and Gaza, based on what Oli just said, still closed. It was supposed to be open this morning. There was supposedly an agreement that had to do with U.N. officials going through the trucks and making sure that everything was okay on everybody's sides. What's the holdup? We don't understand who is actually the main obstacle at this point. That's one. Two, Tom, the military escalation, the prospect for it. The U.S. saying that military bases in Iraq right. and Syria increasingly under attack. Uh, we're going to talk to Professor Schiller here about this. She's an expert, but to me it's the first uh, war by cable TV. And the answer is everybody with diplomacy, with humanitarian aid, is getting out front of a war that is believed to come as soon as this weekend. I mean, we, we don't know, but it is the oddest of oddest sequence of discussions. Let's get to Wendy Schiller, the director of European American politics, rather, and policy director at Brown University. Wendy, wonderful to catch up with you as always. Just talk to me here about the president of the United States and whether he can keep his party together. Well, I mean, I think he made a, a strong effort last night. I think he was a low key speech. But he was coherent. I mean, he just got off a plane, a really long journey to Israel and back. 
Uh, and he basically reverted to a lot of the themes that we've seen from other presidents when there's conflict. You know, America stands for particular things, particular <laughs> principles. And we also have experience with a direct terrorist attack. And we also, as he said, we made some mistakes. I thought that was one of the most pointed lines in the speech last night. You know, we got really as angry as you are after 9-11. We went in, but we made mistakes. And we urge you not to make the same mistakes. It was an interesting sort of world caution on the part of Biden to yeah. Israel in a speech that was supposed to be to the American voters. Wendy, uh, you're too young for this, but we were weaned on Greg Peck in 12 o'clock high. We are so removed from any framework we have of war with this cable TV war. You've got huge perspective on this. How do we handle a cable TV war of immediate news immediate headlines, immediate imagery. Well, you know, I, I, for those of us who are old enough to even remember the first Gulf War, that was not very long, but it was also the first one that was visual, that was televised live all the time. Uh, and we do feel removed from this conflict to a certain extent in America. But of course, the concern is any sort of on-site or domestic terrorism that comes from any support of Israel or, you know, too many uh, civilian deaths in Gaza. This is going to hit home. This will hit the American people in some way, shape or form. And I think President Biden is trying to prepare the American people for the idea that we have to stick with our allies um, and we don't want them to make the same mistakes. But this has made the world more dangerous and we have to be on high alert, not only in Israel, but of course in Ukraine and Taiwan. Wendy, how difficult is it for President Biden that a big faction of his party and a very vocal faction, I should say, has been uh, pretty against him and pretty vocal in protesting some of his measures, uh, in particular the squad I'm thinking of uh, in the House? This is, a, Lisa, to me, a purely regional concern in the state of Michigan, most of all as a swing state in 2024. We have a large Arab American population, a large Palestinian population, of course, Rashida Tlaib, the congresswoman from that area who's Palestinian. And that's a state he needs to win and he needs turnout and he can't have the party breaking with him, even with a popular incumbent Democratic governor in Michigan. So a year from now, this is a real problem for him. So he's really got to tread carefully. And if the, the civilian death count in Gaza goes really sky high, I think it does create a problem for him for the 24 election. But remember, this is an almost an 81-year-old man who's been through a lot, and he is president of the United States, and he is doing what he thinks needs to be done today and tomorrow and the next day. He's unusual. He's not like any other president looking ahead to re-election concerns he really is somebody who is trying to deal with the crises at hand today. And that makes him hard to predict because it's just not a playbook we've seen before. Wendy, kind of shocking. Just to pick up on Congresswoman Tlaib, I checked last night her Twitter account again. The tweet is still up, blaming Israel for the blast of the hospital earlier this week. What do you make of that? Well, John, that is also also Tom's point about the, the speed of news, right? And the sort of everyone said, you know, it was Israel, 500 people died. We're learning now that it's most likely not having, having come from Israel, not an airstrike. And maybe the death count is lower, but it's still a horrific death count. Um, and she's going to continue to do this. And, you know, this creates domestic problems within the Democratic Party. Obviously, um, there are, you know, the Republicans and the Jewish community have been pretty uh, aligned in a lot of ways. Republicans have always expressed strong support for Israel. Now with the House in disarray, no speaker and unable to pass this aid package for Israel, the Democrats have an opportunity to regain some of their momentum with the Jewish community that had been more supportive of Republicans. You know, these tweets uh, and this particular congresswoman may throw a wrench in, in that kind of effort. Wendy Schiller of Brown University. Wendy, thank you for the update. TK, that tweet is still up. The president of the United States has come out and said his own defense department has confirmed to him that they have evidence that that blast, the responsible party for that blast, was not Israel. And yet a tweet is still up I... from a sitting congresswoman in the United States blaming Israel, an ally of America. Make you're, sense of that for me. You're going to always have this, and what's so important here to understand is the scope and scale of the size of her audience. It is, to borrow a scientific phrase, teats weeds. It is, if you look at Pew Research in New Jersey, it's a little audience. Coming up in the next hour, Alex Brazier of BlackRock on this market. Equities right now negative 0.3% from New York. This is Bloomberg. seen the uh, rates moving up and down a lot. I think we have to 
let this play out and watch it. It's clearly a tightening in financial conditions. Does it feel like policy is too tight right now? I would have to say no. If a typical Fed tightening cycle would leave you at five or six percent, and and this is this is in the before the pandemic and before the the low inflation period, you would have had had uh, Fed rates in four or five percent or even higher. My guess is it'll be somewhere in the middle. The committee is proceeding carefully. That message on repeat from the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell. We are proceeding carefully from New York City this morning. Good morning. Your equity market proceeding carefully lower, negative a third of one percent on the S and P. Yields lower by four basis points. Tom, your ten year. 494.56. It's about the bond market, John. You mentioned this before we went live. And you look at equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. There'll be a lot of analysis. Oil popping. We'll talk about that uh, later. Brent crude, if my eyes are not failing me, popping through to a 93 level, really back to where it was, John, in the shock of this war. But it's all the bond market. In every single way we can analyze this, what Bloomberg does best. And, and we can analyze it into next week, up, down, and sideways, losses. Up, up, and away on a 10-year this week, yeah. up 30 basis points or so, but I'm with you on the losses. For some of the long bonds, Tom, yeah. that were issued a couple of years ago, we are talking about losses of something <clears throat> like 50%. And in some cases, in some jurisdictions, countries, right. more than that. Lisa, what did spreads do yesterday? Well, what you can see in the in the spread market has just been completely resilient, even with this why? fear. I, give me a why. <laughs> because companies are in a better shape than the yeah. U.S. government. Yeah. Yesterday, you did see spreads marginally higher, but still subdued based on where people would have thought defaults were. I'm, I looked at high yield spreads, one of the fancies. You know, you know what the symbol is, John, on Bloomberg? Yeah. B-R-A-M-O index. Bramo index. I looked at it. I thought it was L F nine eight O eight. It has a move. That's what it actually is. That's what it is, yeah, right? Yeah. So okay. if you actually right. try to do that, you're going to not get any <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that ticker works. No, I don't know. Definitely but, but, the, but the answer is I was shocked. High yield really hasn't moved out. Yeah, you're seeing it's a little like bit a, marginally, but this has been the story. Corporations are in a better shape than the U.S. government. We're going to look to uh, Israel and the Eastern Mediterranean, but also pay attention to the markets. A Friday brief for you to pick up the pieces of your portfolio. Brian Levitt joins now, global market strategist at Invesco. Brian, I got eight ways to go in the bond market. I blew up twice yesterday over fancy Frank, Frank Fabozzi rationalization. Look at price and tell me what the damage is that's been wrought. Yeah, it's been a challenge. I mean, this was supposed to be a year in which the bond market was going to be better than it had been last year. Last year was one of the worst years we had seen in the bond market. And quite frankly, I think the big concern coming into the year was inflation expectations, and, and those have moderated. It's really been a real growth story. So the question going forward, just how strong is this economy? Does it warrant yields above 5%? I, I still believe we're likely to see the lag effects of policy tightening and a growth slowdown, which would suggest to me uh, the 10-year rate stabling and, and starting to come lower. But, but that's been a bad trade, certainly over the last uh, few weeks, if, if not more. Invesco has a rich portfolio of different types of fixed income, including loans and leveraged loans. Are there shadows out there that Invesco sees, things like leverage in fixed income that we can't observe, but you know it's there? Actually, the fundamentals in the, the corporate bond market are, uh, are quite reasonable to the, to the conversation you were just having. I just tried the Bramo uh, function on the, on the Bloomberg terminal. That didn't work. Yeah, it failed. <laughs> but yeah, the, the fundamentals, as Lisa was suggesting, were... Are, are quite good, and the you know you look at corporate debt to profitability. We're not at we're not at troublesome levels, and and to Lisa's point, the the CFOs were paying attention. They were terming out the loans and generally at, at lower borrowing costs. So it's it doesn't seem to be a fundamental issue in the credit markets. What it is is a a reset in yields that's driving valuations lower in the equity market. So where is the haven? And we've been asking this all week, Brian, but at a certain point, do assets traditionally thought of as risky serve as better havens than the risk-free rate, the risk-free securities of U.S. government debt? I don't know that we're going to have fundamental challenges with the, the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. There's there's clearly a reset right now with regards to what will growth be. 
Uh, but ultimately, I think that the, the the long end will start to moderate. You saw the beige book this week. There's some other mixed factors where economic growth looks a little bit more positive. But ultimately, I would expect the long rate to, to come in as the economy moderates here. But what a lot of investors are doing right now is uh, they're hiding out in money markets, which I thought – would it be the best idea here? I mean, it is nice to get five, five and a half percent uh, without doing much of anything, but you have reinvestment risk. And so far, that reinvestment risk hasn't hit. You've been happy uh, with, with any type of reset 30 days later at a higher yield. But at some point, if the Federal Reserve has to ease, which is what the market expects by the middle of next year, then you would want to go further out in maturity or you would want to look to those corporate bonds where the fundamentals are quite good, and even municipal bonds. I don't think enough are paying attention to the fundamental strength of the municipal bond market after all of the support from the federal government following the pandemic. Are you starting to see signs that we've reached that pivot point where people are starting to actually think about reinvestment risk in a way that they haven't really had to earlier this year? This week, we actually saw some outflows from money market accounts, and we saw inflows into U.S. government bond funds. Do you see this as a sort of tipping point? I think we should be nearing that inflection point. I mean, it's 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 hard to say based just on a on a week of data. But in speaking to investors, um, what I'm hearing, particularly from the financial advisor community, is that they would like some ammunition to help their clients to move off of money market. They intuitively understand that historically, when you have an inverted yield curve, whether that was 2000, 2006, you're better off going further out. Um, but it's a hard thing to explain right now to to the individual investor who maybe had their well, money in bank deposits and, and just wants to just wants to capture a short term 5 percent. Let's ask a lead you question then. You have new cash to deploy. Do you buy bonds torn apart, torn asunder or do you buy equities? Well, it depends what you're looking to accomplish. I would buy equities. Um, I think that they're going to move directionally in the same way. You start to see the the weaker economic data or more moderate economic data, then you're likely to see the peak rate environment emerge. And, and typically, Tom, when we look out in an environment where we've already had peak inflation, you get peak rates, peak tightening. Historically, that creates a nice place for both stocks and bonds over the next couple of years, but certainly equity outperformance over the next couple of years. Hey, Brian, good to get your view as always. Brian Levitt there of Invesco on equities on bonds looking out to next year. Barry Bannister of Stiefel caught up with him earlier this week. He's looking for a slowdown. Guess when? Back end of 2024. <laughs> Back end of next year. Well, that's what he's looking some for. Some people Tom. are looking for that. Ed Hyman through Julian Emanuel reaffirmed his recession call for 2024. And, uh, you know, I, I don't really know what to make of it in a jumble of going into this weekend. My head's frankly spinning. I just looked at one of the major, major bond funds out there. This is a Vanguard product. Everybody's grandmother owns it. And the drawdown from not the beginning of the year, but let's say the first week of February, you're solid minus 8% on price. Now, you've made some income along the way. But I'm sorry, you're opening the envelope. You know, John Tucker opens a 201K. That's that and he looks out. at the damage. And, I mean, you know, on a retail account, you're getting... Hammered They're going to see the damage market. in bonds, without yeah. a doubt. We're trying to work out what corporate America is telling us right now about the U.S. economy. And we're getting conflicting information. You look at the banks. Bank of America is talking about a consumer slowdown. J.P. Morgan's raising guidance. Look at the latest on consumer discretionary spending. LVMH, the airlines, are saying we've seen the post-pandemic boom. You look to Netflix, they're hiking prices. Lisa Tesla, they're cutting prices. Make sense of it all. Nope, not going to do it. Sorry. Difficult, right? <laughs> well, this is the issue, is that there are all these different cycles that are playing out, these sort of micro cycles, and putting it together has been uniquely challenging. What I do see is that economists surveyed by Bloomberg, there was a monthly survey that came out overnight, and it showed that economists are boosting their growth expectations. They are reducing the chance of recession, which is no longer a base case. They are talking about an annualized 3.5% rate of GDP growth in the U.S. for uh, the third quarter, which would be the fastest for the third in two quarter. years. We're talking about accelerating kinds exactly. of growth. Exactly. Well, some people are talking a five-handle on that 3.5%. I'm with you, but others, adults, are talking 5%. Neil Dutzer is talking about some big numbers. Yeah. It has been for a while. I've called it the three-month rolling recession call. 
That's the yeah, year so far. Yeah, it's been a three-month roll in recession call. Now it's six months. Now it's six maybe, months. Maybe maybe nine. Maybe nine. <laughs> yeah, it's just too much. It continues. Growth, you know, right? we got a two and twenty payout on the triple lever stall cash. How's that working? It's out? great. You, you had a good for year. the first time in quarters. We've got a, a payout to the general partner. Equities down a third of one percent on the S and P from New York. This is Bloomberg. towards a week of losses on the S&P 500. Equity futures shaping up as follows on the S&P on the Nasdaq. We're negative a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down four tenths of 1%. The Nasdaq negative for a third straight session yesterday. Bramo, will it be day four? And how much is this tied to yields and how much is this due to fundamentals? Right now, if Netflix is representative, it seems like the fundamentals are pretty good. So you have to wonder, are people getting nervous about 2.5% on the real yields in the U.S.? Not at the moment. Brian Levitt of Invesco is talking about playing the recovery to the recession we've not had yet. <laughs> did, you not did you notice that in the last 10 minutes? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got upset twice yesterday. I was rude. But what I just, I've about? had it. I've what? had it. Seriously. Okay, serious. We've Let's never go. seen this and we have guests have they have narratives that are about rationalizing the great moderation the available evidence the great moderation is over even though chairman powell spoke against that yesterday i personally cut people <clears throat> some slack because they come on the show and try to come up with a narrative and then they have a sort of range of probabilities in their models Fair. to try to you it's know play them reversal. out i mean this is my sense and it's a very difficult moment to try to come up with a narrative when it's flipping and flopping every single day and when you're not going to be right period full stop because even if you get the narrative right you're going to get the market wrong so this, this is, is what, a really tough that's tough what, market that's what tom would always say well, i'm going to cut some slack people need to adapt and usually and she's You're becoming sensitive. And you know, in corporate America adapts and adjusts. You know, Let me just tell it's you. New. You're feeling kind today. That's new. It's I, new. I'm feeling a little bit frustrated For trying November. to put narrative to some yeah. of these price moves the that are just season. not understood. Yeah. It's difficult to ascribe a narrative to what's taking place Thank in the bond you. market, but we'll try. Two years, 10 years, 30 <laughs> years. <laughs> Looks like this. This week, cycle highs across the curve. Two year, briefly, through 520. We're back to, to about 515, 68. 30 year, through 5%. 10 year, get in there. Earlier in the session, really, really close. 499.20, Tom, on a 10-year. Right now, 494.35. First thing I looked at in, the real yield, 2.46%. Do you believe we had a 250 yesterday and all the hoopla, particularly with a missile attack from Yemen? I mean, it's just oh, it's Aggressive, amazing. aggressive. 250. Bear steepener. Never, ever have I framed 250 real yield. Amazing, amazing. Let's finish on crude. Second week yep. of gains, WTI, Brent. Have a sneak peek of things right now. Up by a little more than 1%. Back in the 90s on WTI crude. Getting back towards 94, Tom, on Brent. 93.54. Did a moving average study of when it was well over 100. About $111 a barrel is what I'm going to go. It's an approximation. That's a Friday guesstimate. 111 is that feeling of higher oil prices we had a number of years ago. That's the latest in the price action. Under surveillance this morning, Israel striking targets in both Gaza and Lebanon as the Israel-Hamas war continues. This coming as a U.S. destroyer intercepted cruise missiles fired towards Israel from Yemen. In his address last night, President Biden making the case for more funding for Israel and Ukraine's war efforts. I know these conflicts can seem far away. And it's natural to ask, why does this matter to America? Hamas and Putin represent different threats, but they share this in common. They both want to completely annihilate a neighboring democracy, completely annihilate it. A rare 15-minute address in the Oval Office, TK. The president is about to make the case to Congress to deliver $100 billion in resources to support, I believe, Ukraine, Russia, the southern border, and Taiwan as well, right? I believe it's all All four issues, that. all thrown into one time. political to get everybody's vote about what they care about. But I'm fascinated. We've got a congresswoman coming up here from the Midwest today. I'm really interested in the emotion this weekend, particularly with the news yesterday, it's their war. Mr. Biden's trying to say it's everyone's war. It's our war. The Europeans are the same message. I think there's a lot of people out there saying, wait a minute, is this our war? It's a, open to debate. Well, it's become our war when you talk about the attacks on the Iraqi U.S. Uh, Army base, as well as the one in Fair. Syria. And mm -hmm. you see uh, the U.S. warships in the Mediterranean actually engage in terms of shooting down certain missiles. So there is a question of, yes, the U.S. is already involved. What should that role be? My bigger question here is actually about Saudi Arabia, because they're suddenly becoming a much more active player, beating with the head of UAE for the first time in a very long time. How much has it become Saudi Arabia versus Iran in a right. sort of covert way 
without angering some of the population. And, and not to do, uh, do uh, Civics 101 or Geography 101, but missiles from Yemen is something that Riyadh pays attention to. Does it really matter where those Big missiles time. are going? That's something to the north of Yemen they really pay attention to. Uh, that's the latest abroad. Let's get to the dysfunction at home. Congressman Jim Jordan continuing his bid for House Speaker after previously saying he would support a plan to Cut temporarily off. expand the powers <laughs> of Congressman Patrick McHenry. The interim speaker, after a four-hour closed-door meeting, <clears throat> House Republicans, with House Republicans, Jordan saying this, I'm still running for Speaker. I plan to go to the floor and get the vote and win this race. Jordan holding a news conference at 8 a.m. this morning. Bramo is going to sit tight and stay tuned to that in about 90 minutes' time. Well, this is going to be fun. He's probably not going to get any uh, votes that he got uh, in terms of the first time around, anything close to that. He's losing votes as this goes on. There is increasing a uh, hardening kinds of tensions within the party as there's certain intimidation tactics going on. There's a larger question pairing the whole question about Biden and his speech yesterday with this confusion. He's not going to get anyone to pass the $100 billion. They can't even bring it to the floor. So how does he sort of play this? AMH in the next hour is going to tell you how. Looking forward to that. <laughs> the cuts to Credit Suisse, they continue. The UBS is preparing for the latest. This coming from Financial News. The Swiss bank saying around 10% of support staff in areas including compliance, risk and marketing will be impacted. CEO Sergio Armotti previously saying about 3,000 jobs will be, quote, made redundant over the next years as it completes its takeover of the bank, still working through what could be a really, really messy, messy fallout for this combination. How do they keep people without really embolden, um, emboldening them with some kind of morale boost, given these rounds of cuts and this feeling that this is going to be dragged out for a while? It's a very difficult moment. I'm going to go to a, a separate story, which is linked directly to it, John. It's Jack Snyder's writing for Bloomberg about the flagship Credit Suisse real estate fund, global mm. fund, big, fancy people jetting around the world, buying towers and all that, it's marked down 9%. And as I said, the news now that we're talking on surveillance is next quarter's accounting. So if Credit Suisse is marking it down 9% in third quarter, as global property correction accelerates, where do we accelerate in the January of next year? That word global is important. Yeah. Not just America. Yeah. Some yeah. Pain it's a very, well, I'll put it out on Twitter. Jack Sider's writing that up this morning. Joining us now, well. Eric Nelson, <clears throat> macro me. strategist. I was down looking at the Jackson. At Wells Fargo. Don't worry about it. We'll it's get to the next guest, Tom. Right. Let's talk it's about right. markets, Eric. We're going to proceed carefully. Is November a dead meeting? I think so, John. It's priced at maybe two or three basis points at this point. And the Fed has made it pretty clear they want to be patient. Powell wants to be careful. I think it's going to take, even in December, a lot to, to move the Fed off the sidelines at this point. Uh, the message from Chair Powell yesterday was we want to see continued evidence of above trend growth. That's a key sort of uh, you know, precondition right. for more tightening. That means at least one, if not two more, above 200,000 NFP reports. Right. I'm not sure we're going to get that. Eric, I got yens for 150. I know it's a side story, but I'm sorry, it's not a side story. On dollar yen, you know, help us get through the weekend on this. If we get a 150 print, is that a trigger for Japanese institutional action? Historically, Tom, it's been about both levels and volatility. So breaking 150 and accelerating, hitting 151, 152 in a short space of time, that has brought the BOJ in in the past. I think last time, you know, back in early October, uh, it was probably more of rate checking, less intervention. So yeah. they've clearly made a line in the sand here. They're worried about this level, but I think you do need to see some more but vol after 150. The reason I bring it up because of the Credit Suisse story and that all of a sudden, can I say, Japan is affected by Eastern Mediterranean offense, uh, events. Japan is affected by a global bond market route. Yeah, and there's a little bit of uh, sort of circularity here, right, Tom? You, to the extent that the BOJ will tend to, or rather the Ministry of Finance will tend to offload treasuries in order to fund this intervention, you do have this, this sort of circularity, which is a problem both for the bond market and for dollar yen, right? Right now, Eric, there seems to be a question about how much the market is actually appreciating some of the events transpiring in the Middle East, the conflict. And there have been a number of big investors that have come out and said that the market is really underpricing the risk of an escalation that's percolating in certain corners. What's your view? 
Well, I think it's it's a question of timing, right, right, Lisa? I mean, we, we went into last weekend worried about a ground invasion that didn't necessarily occur as quickly as, as thought. Seems like maybe this weekend is a little bit more likely. Uh, but I think the the question here is, you know, what is what is the the scope of of conflict that needs to to really bring this to the fore? Uh, for the market. I think it was interesting that uh, Fed Chair Powell actually mentioned this in his speech yesterday. He said geopolitics was a downside risk. Haven't heard that in quite a while. Um, you know, back in, in 2022, Ukraine Russia was two way risk. It was inflation to the upside, growth to the downside. Um, so I think that, you know, that's maybe one reason why you haven't seen, uh, you know, a, a further sell off in the front end on the back of those comments yesterday. The Fed's clearly being cautious here. So from your vantage point, what are you looking for to understand when it <clears throat> escalates to a level that people have to price in a little bit more aggressively? Well, I think you, you certainly need to see, you know, other, you know, large actors being brought into. So I think that, that the big question for a lot of people is, you know, to what extent and, and at what point is Iran drawn into this? That's certainly a, a big focus. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to make a call on that, but I think that's probably a, a big trigger. You know, outside of that, I, I think, you know, looking, focusing back on the fundamentals and, and sort of what's driving the bond market here is, you know, to what extent is there going to be an impact on growth? Because that's really been the big, I think, factor here driving this, this sell-off in the bond market. And until that changes, either domestically or globally, uh, it's hard to see a, a sustained rally here. The Fed wants to slow down. Bottom line. I imagine this Federal Reserve is actually quite nervous, Bramo. Nervous about the fact that the data is still pretty decent going into the fourth quarter with the prospect of maybe that data continue to improve and Lisa ultimately reluctant to re-engage with the hiking cycle because Bramo can you imagine what they'd have to do they hike again in December and people start to think that maybe they're not done and we go into 2024 Priya Misra was talking about this over at JP Morgan with me yesterday just imagine we have to restart the cycle and I don't mean just one more hike I mean like they have to go further because the data keeps surprising to the upside so when they say wait what I believe it means is, please, between now and December, show us a slowdown in this economy because they have got a massive problem in December if they don't see one. Especially because, to Mohamed Alarian's point, I know you're catching up with him today, the stop-start oh, yeah. type of uh, rate hikes is that much more damaging to a market that's trying to get a sense of linearity. And that, to me, is the yeah. bigger risk for them than the slowdown that they're hoping, to your point, will come. It's October 20th at 10 a.m. this morning. We'll be holding a meeting for 20 people. It'll be on the 14th floor. We we'll be invited? looking at penciling out our outlook for 2024. That's happening right now. Can you right imagine now. those meetings? You, that's happening right now. I always I, say I, about I, the year ahead outlooks. They're written in October. They're published in December. You, know, and I, you sit I'm, there in January and you rewrite them in March. That's kind of how it works. But I, I'm going to cut them slack here because they're coming off a, a, a medical event, the pandemic, and maybe we guessed wrong and history will tell us we guessed wrong those tales from the pandemic, including the fiscal stimulus. But all we can say for certain is the majority of people, including Tom Keene, have been wrong this year. That's all there is to it. It's October and we're supposed to recalibrate. Let's get a Good final one that. into Eric Nelson of Wells Fargo. <laughs> Eric, how reluctant will they be? Will they be dragged into this skip, kicking and screaming into December if they need to hike again? Yeah, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, a, a pretty challenging point for them if, if we're still fair, you know, facing down 200,000 plus uh, jobs a month by December. Yeah, I, I grew up playing hockey and, and one of the things that I it was always taught was, you know, follow where the puck's going. And I think that right now that's where Powell is really focused is, you know, some of these early and, and continued some, you know, weakness and some of the leading indicators rather than consumer strength, which kind of tells you, you know, where the puck already is. Um, so I think for now, the Fed is still looking at some of these, these forward indicators, and that's why they're so cautious. And frankly, I understand it. Continuing claims, continuing to rise. You know, it's not the be-all, end-all indicator, but I think the momentum is really starting to slow. Eric, thank you, sir. Eric Nelson there of Wells Fargo on this Federal Reserve. Just looking out, I think the good news for the Fed is that you can generate the kind of payrolls growth we've had, and wage growth isn't accelerating. In fact, quite the opposite, Bramo. Things are slowing down. The chairman alluded to that. <clears throat> that. That connection there between the payrolls growth we've seen and wage growth, maybe not as pronounced as it would have been in previous decades, previous cycles, and perhaps they can take some comfort from that. And that point that he made yesterday was actually sort of new. It was a different nuance. He previously sort of hedged when it talked about wage pressures, but he seemed to indicate it was steadily slowing, which takes some of the pressure off. Again, is this non-inflationary growth? Is that a thing? Can we deal with that? If it is, they're going to embrace it. <laughs> Can they? Love every second of it. Mm. Non-inflationary <laughs> growth, isn't that a dream? It's a dream. Is it correct? And do they have to deal with it later on?
Equity Futures down a third of 1%. Dan Tannenbaum of Oliver Wyman on sanctions Good. up next. I'm going to send to Congress an urgent budget request to fund America's national security needs, to support our critical partners, including Israel and Ukraine. It's a smart investment that's going to pay dividends for American security for generations. The President of the United States, an address to the nation last night, a rare 15-minute Oval Office address from the President of the United States, setting the groundwork, laying the groundwork, potentially, for a hundred billion dollars of resources from Congress. How difficult that will be to achieve remains to be seen. From New York City, welcome to the program. Your equity market on the S&P 500 negative here by a third of 1%. It yields lower by four or five basis points, backing away from multi-decade highs on a 10-year yield, 494.14. If you're just tuning in, Tom, really, really close yeah. to 5% earlier, 499.20. Backing, uh, uh, backing away from where we were a couple hours ago, but John, I'm going to say there's no respite here. It's completely driven by news and as Oliver Crook said in Tel Aviv there's minimal news about any military effort other than those Yemen missiles that uh, were taken out by the US. But that just speaks to the risk of US involvement doesn't minute it? Minute by minute. Yeah. Events of the last 24 hours. Yeah, absolutely. And the yeah. humanitarian issues as well Tom that's going to become a bigger and bigger problem. Yeah. US and Europe pushing for that aid to get into Gaza and the Rafa crossing as far as Ollie <clears throat> is concerned in the last hour or so Still close, that link between no. Egypt and Gaza. And this is the southern border. Lisa, what have you studied on that? I know you've taken a look at that. I just want to understand why it hasn't opened, what the holdup is, and honestly, how quickly people are running out of water. Yeah. I'm reading the reports and just wondering, you know, are people going to actually start yeah, starving and, 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 and dying of thirst? And that, to me, is just a catastrophic outcome. My amateur take, which is, I don't think, really been done up correctly, is we look at Gaza as a homogenous entity. And the answer is northern Gaza is much more urbanized and affluent than the fields of southern Gaza. So that's even more reason to bring the humanitarian uh, effort in. Right now we're going to get a brief on this. So what we've done with surveillance with this war is try to speak to experts. Daniel Tannenbaum is global anti-financial crime practice leader at Oliver Wyman. He is expert in the idea of sanctions. He's also at the Atlantic at Council. Dan, thank you so much for uh, coming in for a brief this morning. Are Hezbollah and Hamas are they entities that you can sanction? I mean, they have been sanctioned as terrorist groups for years, but they're non-state actors, largely. So it's not like there's uniforms that people are wearing, that there's a directory of officials, you know, say for some of the, the top leaders of those organizations. You're really left to try and identify people that may have a connection, that may be supporting them. There's companies that are trying to provide supplemental data to banks and payments companies to try and make sure that, that you're rooting out any Hamas or Hezbollah related payments. If we say the money comes from Iran, fine. Is it in suitcases? Is it a Matt Damon movie? How does the money actually move to support their military efforts? I mean, cash is, is fungible, which you know, one party in the U.S. government started talking about a lot this over the last few weeks. I, I think it, it's moving a bunch of different ways. There's crypto-related funding that's come out, and the U.S. government has worked pretty actively to try and thwart any crypto-related funding of Hamas and Hezbollah-related efforts. It's physical cash. Um, it's commodity. It's a whole bunch of different ways to fund the effort. Did America turn a blind eye to Iranian crude production? It's been an interesting two years if you look at what's happening, um, obviously, with the crisis in Ukraine, the sanctions on Russia and trying to pull some Russian oil off the market to a limited extent. I think the U.S. certainly wasn't as focused on enforcement of Iranian oil sanctions to keep some of that oil on the market. The dynamic you see now is Iranian tensions are increasing. Venezuelan sanctions were eased on Tuesday. And in the next few months, you'll see Venezuelan oil, which is largely the dirtiest oil in the world, come back onto the market, uh, maybe not at the same scale you need. Um, but in short, yes. But there, you know, this administration has done a very good job of doing the calculus of not cutting off its nose despite its face, especially when you look at energy prices, which are the most tangible reality of impact of some of these events. This doesn't feel strategic, though, in the long term. It doesn't feel that way at all. So you've got two conflicts taking place at the moment potentially a bigger one said to take place soon. You've got Ukraine and you've got Israel. The immediate response to Ukraine was to absolutely drain the SPR to multi-decade lows. 
And as you've alluded to, not quite said it, but alluded to it, they took their eye off the ball regarding sanctions on Iran. Arguably, arguably, because of domestic politics at home and the price of energy. And now what are we doing with Venezuela? Are we sitting here saying it's a coincidence? Just a coincidence? It's not a coincidence at all. So it, what do you think about the long-term strategic aims of sanction policy in this country by this White House based on the very fact that we seem to be responding to short-term energy issues? I mean, unpack what's happening right now. You have Russia's invasion of Ukraine, again, that's drifting into the second year. You have U.S.-China issues that continue. Uh, you've now got this crisis in the Middle East with the attack on Israel on uh, October 7th and the associated response. All of these are connected, and the common theme is the energy market in terms of looking at who's buying what from where and how to manage some of the domestic expectations. Do you think that the U.S.'s unwillingness to push oil prices higher is part of the reason why the U.S. is not taking a harder stance right now with Iran? I do think that's part of the calculus here. Um, it, it has to be. When you look at, at what's been happening, if you look at what OPEC Plus has tried to announce with trying to limit some of the supply to keep prices intentionally high, it, it is a balancing act. There certainly has been enforcement of the Iranian sanctions, but we've known that China has become a larger and larger purchaser of Iranian oil, and there's been no consequences to that. But I do think it's all part of th – there's a broader calculus that they're really trying to look at because all these conflicts hang together. One of the confusions of trying to come up with a narrative right now is that what you feel and the narrative that makes sense to the emotion doesn't translate on the ground with the flows of money. And yesterday I was reading a Wall Street Journal article talking about how a lot of the money that Hamas got was from humanitarian aid, was from what people from the U.S. and Israel gave to the Palestinian people, that a lot of the borders that were opened were then taxed that much more by Hamas. How much is this one of the main obstacles in actually getting help to innocent civilians who are really struggling? I mean, we saw this challenge in Afghanistan for years where aid was getting misappropriated by the Taliban, especially since the U.S. pullout. And that's been part of the challenge in putting aid into that market. That, that is the real threat. When you're dealing with non-state actors that have every desire to try and seize upon Western aid, <laughs> Um, you know, this is what you end up seeing of that siphoning off of aid. It's critical for charities to do diligence on where money's going. But again, in that non-state actor scenario, you may not have clarity that some of these actors on the ground that claim to be doing good are really fronts for Hamas yeah. and Hezbollah. Dan, you mentioned this is a really key phrase, maybe the best phrase I've heard this week, drifting into another year. I've been reading Kitchener, World War I. The British were certain it was a four-month war. That worked out. This is not 73, forget about 48. It's not 73, it's not 67 for Israel. Are we completely misjudging the short-termism that is the human condition of the beginning of a war? I mean, you've seen a lot of attention with Rishi Sunak, with Biden, with Blinken, kind of parking himself in the Middle East over the last week. I, I think there's every desire to look for a proportionate response. And to your point, Lisa, I think it's tough to balance some of the personal and, and on the ground dynamics of this. I mean, realistically, there's every attempt being made to try and stave off a further significant attack that further draws away support from Israel. Um, and I think that is of the dynamic that the U.S. is trying to face along with its allies and trying to work with the Netanyahu government to think about a response. It's, it's hard to separate that emotional response to not over-escalating something that draws Iran and other proxies into a broader war in the region. What is a proportional response to this? I mean, you, you know I can't answer that. I mean, it's, it's tough. You've seen thousands of people killed on the Israeli side, thousands of people killed on the Gaza side that were not all Hamas. I, I think the proportional response is really ensuring that this doesn't drift into a larger Middle Eastern conflict, and however that ultimately comes about. Dan. It's good to see you. It's good to catch up. Really, di really, really difficult briefly. conversation. Really, really. Dan Tannenbaum there yeah. of Oliver Wyman. Hey, TK, this stuff is so complex. So, the so com difficult. The complexity is there and it's been there in history. And the question to me, and this goes to Lisa's discussion of the humanitarian immediacy of this weekend, is this is not the same. As a media war, it's a completely different formula for the politicians and, dare I say, for the military as well. Although, 
in fairness, every war has been marked by propaganda. World War II was marked by massive mm -hmm. propaganda, which we studied in school. The question now is, when we look back at this war, how do we pair propaganda without it becoming sort of the catalyst for a wider conflict that embroils a wider number of potential state actors? The blast of that hospital earlier this week, just a fantastic example of what you're speaking about, Lisa. Exactly. And this is what people are talking about. What does the truth matter if people won't care what the truth is, and they're going to go with the narrative that works best to uh, to deal with their population. It's seeing that play out, not just abroad, but domestically as well. Alex Brazer of BlackRock is coming up shortly. Your equity market at the moment on the S&P, pulling back just a touch. We're down about a third of 1% on the S&P 500, heading towards a week of losses. From New York, this is Bloomberg. We are still very much in a late cycle economy. I think the Fed keeps rate higher for longer until they get a recession. High for long will still be an important part of the narrative. We're going back to 2%. The Fed is absolutely capable of getting us there. I think the worries are going to come for next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. What a week in this bond market this morning. Very close to 5% on a 10-year yield. The high of the session, 4.9920. In the equity market, TK, negative a third of 1% on the S&P. The <clears> stock market heading towards a week of losses. On the bond market, yields right. up by more than 30 basis points this week. The separation here has been a huge. The non-correlation is off the chart. We've got a gentleman from BlackRock coming up to talk about that. Equity market, is it a bull or bear market? I don't know. Bond market. We're not having a debate. It's a bear market. It's a bear market. It's a bear market. Have we fully realized the pain associated <clears throat> with those losses, Tom? Keep going back to the same question in the bond no, market no, at the long end. All. No, no, I, I don't think so. I think Lisa's done a great job on this. I think I, I look at every real estate transaction uh, as well, and the answer is there's much more to come. I go to the Credit Suisse article, Jack Sitters, today, where Credit Suisse marks down their flagship real estate fund 9%. The, to your point, Tom, and I think it's a really good one, and John, to your question, have we realized losses? No, because we haven't had mass selling. We haven't had institutions fully move away from bonds in any material way. How many days, how many months, how many years have we heard people come on and say 60-40 has been torpedoed for now, but sure. it looks even more attractive next year, right? <laughs> We've seen this, but this will be the third consecutive year of bond losses, which has never happened in history before. So at what point do you start saying, well, does that dynamic change? Not the, on a Friday to have the brain freeze over my brain's already frozen over but you know <laughs> let's let it go and look at this and here's what i would say the whole rationalization right now is mark to market versus we'll own it forever someday it'll be back to maturity not a single pro has told me that's valid analysis. You've got to do a net present value duration analysis. And if your portfolio is at 15 years, John, there's a seven, eight, nine year tip point where it's oops. There's still two and a half months. Still two and a half months. Could still work. Couldn't it? Kinda. Right. What, no. what kind of losses are we talking about? Hold on a second. Put, I'm going to start. We're interviewing right. John in the no. 8th I think we've had like a, a 170 basis point move yeah. off the lows on a 10-year yield I, in, in March. So I'm not sure whether you can reverse that very quickly unless you get a collapse in the economy and something else happens with the financial system. That's the question for the Federal Reserve. Is it a substitute for further tightening from the Fed in November, in December? The words of the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Lisa, at the margin... At the margin, what does that mean? I think it means that he doesn't really want to weigh in on this, and that was his punting. That's I sensed the same thing, didn't you? That's what I've, I felt, because he also said that it doesn't seem like, like that basically policy is overly tight is overly restrictive. It doesn't seem like it is hampering the economy in a material way. So pair that <clears> with the idea that, yes, it's getting more restrictive, and yes, on the margins, this might do something. It is a wishy-washy, don't ask me, I'm okay, not going to tell you anything. They're data dependent, but what are they de data dependent for? The October jobs report, or are they dependent on what Apple does and Microsoft does in 10 days? I think the data, without yeah, a doubt, I think yeah. the economic data. I'm not sure if Apple speaks to the I mean, US economy I'm not looking quite for the them same to way. Cut rates, but I, this higher for longer thing, all that's going to be redefined, as you say, John, in the next, you know, 100 days, whatever it is to the end of the year. Until something breaks and something yeah. did. 
break earlier this year, and you saw what happened to the bond market after that. Equities right now on the S&P 500, pulling back on the S&P, we're negative by a couple of tenths of 1%. We're down a third. Yield to lower by five basis points, 4.9392. Tensions in the Middle East simmering for the last couple of weeks. We've got crude back in the 90s. WCI, $90.60. Crude up here, Lisa, by about 1.4%. So today we get the last gasp of Fed speak before the quiet period next week ahead of their uh, meeting that ends the month of October. Philly Fed President Patrick Harker speaking at 9 a.m. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester at 12.15 p.m. What I am looking at is an infinitesimal chance of a rate hike at the November 1st meeting, and that I think they're going to lean into in the uncertainty of the moment. 12 p.m., President Biden is meeting with European Council President Charles Michel and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Curious to hear how they discuss some of the potential tariff battles between the U.S. and EU, but more importantly, understanding how close these allies are at a time of a lot of international conflicts. And today, I'm actually most interested to understand the regional banks. John, you said something did break. Yeah, here it is. And we're going to be seeing the PacWest acquire Bank of California report earnings, Regions Financial, Comerica, Huntington Bank shares, and aftermarket Western Alliance, which has been under a lot of pressure. These have not climbed off the mat, and we continue to see this. And how much do we see the pain that we see the anecdotes point to in the earnings of some of these banks? We want a read on the American economy. American Express right now, third quarter EPS 330, the estimate 295. Listen to the target for 2024, revenue growth in excess of 10%. Tom, that stock is up by 2.7%. In the series of headlines coming out that we'll digest here, of course, we'll have reports for you, Chanel Bassick leading that coverage. And the answer here is simple. You've got double-digit nominal GDP feel running through to revenues. And what's absolutely stunning to me is this phrase, total network volumes up 7%. That's just a boom report from these American fee based Express. cards. I'm just going through this. Amex saying fee based cards accounted for more than 70% of all new accounts it added in the quarter. The chief executive saying demand for our premium products remains high. These these elite cards, Bramo, you pay like five, six hundred dollars a year mm -hmm. for. I know right? you're just trying to tweak me because you know exactly where this is going. <laughs> that basically this is entrance to the you know sky lounges for Delta, so and this basically is this is in. how you get in. And everybody is going to keep leaning into this because it's a cash cow for both American Express and. Delta, and you could see similar types of arrangements. You know, this is the future. I, I, I will Apparently. say, <laughs> I, I know we've got to go here, but John, into this earnings season, the great underestimation is the inflation overlay, the GDP overlay, high nominal GDP. Oops, revenues were better than expected. Stock is up by more than 2% in early yeah. trading. Alex Brazier joins us now, deputy head of the BlackRock Investment Institute. Alex, great to catch up with you, sir, as always. Let's start here because I know you and the team have put out a note in the last few days about the tectonic shifts that we've witnessed in the global economy and in markets as well. Alex, this regime, how different is this regime going to be to years, decades gone by? Very, I think, is the short answer. You know, you were debating earlier the end of the great moderation. We're pretty clear. We have seen the end of the great moderation. And that reflects a different geopolitical environment, a different macro environment. And markets are beginning to catch up with some of that. But they're not really catching up with the fact that, for example, the geopolitical environment has changed absolutely fundamentally. And even if we can't spot the triggers ahead for geopolitical events, including around the Middle East now, we know that over the next 10 years, the average supply shock facing the global economy as a result of that is going to be negative in the same way that for the last 20 years it was positive. So central banks are going to find themselves fighting inflation much more often, even as we get out of this well, episode. Alex, you did a tour of duty at the Bank of England on financial stability. It's not appropriate for you to discuss the executive dynamics and the performance dynamics of BlackRock, but you can advise on a bond route that every portfolio at BlackRock, every portfolio Rick Reader and company has, they're all south. How do you advise your team this weekend on the instability or stability of the bond system? Well, we've actually been underweight for many years, the long end of the US curve. We saw two things needing to happen. One was a repricing of the average level of policy rates as we go into this regime where central banks are going to be fighting inflation more often. And the other was a repricing of the term premium, which is now taking center stage uh, in the market debate. Those things are now beginning to happen. And we've reached a level, we think, where we've become a bit more neutral in the short term. We see risks now in both directions. But still, over strategic horizons, 
we remain underweight the long end because there's still not that much term premium. And this is an environment where you've got weaker trend growth, higher level of policy rates, the fiscal dynamics are very difficult as a result, and that's an environment that demands a term premium. Alex, earlier to this year, we were talking to a number of bond strategists who said 2.5% on the real yield was basically the tipping point, where stocks would sell off and it would be this reinforcing cycle. Are you saying that that's not true, that we could get to a 3%, we could get to a 3.5% and be a more accurate term structure for the economy as you see it? Well, over the longer term, certainly, we could go higher from here as the term premium gets re-established. But I think it's important to note that as the term premium gets re-established, that's not necessarily bad news for equities. What's strange up to this point is that policy rates have been, or future expectations of policy rates have been repriced. And yet we haven't seen the equity market really respond very decisively to that in aggregate. So does that mean to you, Alex, that returns going forward aren't necessarily going to be reduced, but that stocks are just going to have higher multiples, that they're going to be a better engine of growth and reliable counterweight to inflation and a higher term premium type of structure for bonds? Well, I think you see two features favoring equities in the long term. You've, you've listed both of them there. But I, I also would note that even if it's a challenging environment, <clears throat> the end of the great moderation, it's a challenging environment for broad risk asset exposures. Actually, the drivers of the end of the, geo of right. the great moderation, whether that's geopolitics or the energy transition or demographic change, they're all big mega forces changing the way our economy works. And we're much more interested in those now as sources of return in, in portfolios. Alex, I'm absolutely fascinated on a broader view, and again with your tour of duty at the Bank of England, if with the great moderation over, as you stated, are we going to have an actuarial reset of our generation or frankly multiple generations. Do we need to start thinking about a bond reset to a higher required return for pension investments? I don't know whether it's a higher required return, but we're definitely having a reset to a higher actual return environment. And this, by the way, is why it's strange that equity multiples in aggregate haven't yet adjusted to what's happened in the bond market. We see yields remaining at close to these levels over the long term. As the term, maybe higher as the term premium gets re-established, because we're going into an environment now where the Fed, other developed market central banks, are going to be leaning against looser fiscal policy than they were in the past, mm -hmm. and they're going to be fighting, on average, these negative supply shocks, whether that's energy prices, other geopolitical shocks, or demographic-related labor supply shocks. So returns are going to be higher once we get through this adjustment. We're seeing that now in the bond market. We're going to need to see higher returns in the equity market and a range of other markets as well in the future. Alex, just quickly, when you and the team use that phrase long term, how many years is that? What are you thinking about? Well, in a strategic portfolio, we're looking five years and out. In a tactical portfolio, we're looking over the next 12 months. And we see over the next 12 months the risks in the long end more balanced. But beyond that 12 months, mm. we still see the term premium grinding higher. So when you say high for longer, you're actually thinking about high for maybe over the next five years. Absolutely. And I think that what's interesting in the way the Fed debate has gone is as people have focused on reaching the peak, the market has then begun to shift its attention to, well, what does the future look like? Where do we go back to as inflation comes down? And actually, that, we think that's a lot higher than we were pre-pandemic, partly because of the fiscal position, partly because of the energy transition, which is driving higher investment, and partly because, as I say, central banks are going to be, on average, facing supply shocks where they're constantly needing to push down on inflation, which means holding rates, on average, tight. Fascinating. Alex, thank you. Alex Brazier there of BlackRock, the latest from them the Investment Institute and what's going on in this bond market. If you are just joining us, welcome to the programme. The S&P 500 at the moment, negative by 0.2%. When we talk about high for longer, let's talk about what the longer means. For Alex and the team, as they look at bond yields at the moment, Bramo, they're talking about maybe over the next five years. Get used to this. And then, and then what? And we don't know what the and then what is, which is just yet another layer of uncertainty. The funny thing is that that doesn't necessarily mean in his eyes that stocks are going to underperform. And this is the sea change that I've seen is that there isn't a natural correlation to bond selling off and that actually creating a headwind given how high yields go for stocks because really it is being driven by yeah. the way Lee kind of artificial intelligence and all yeah. of these other kinds of trends. That was a conversation of the week with Mr. Brazier there. That was really, really sobering, and that's a complete readjustment that you're going to begin to see. And on a microcosm basis, it will be a percolation like Credit Suisse marking down global real estate 9%. Multiply that in a dimensional basis, John, 20, 30, 40 different 
ways. I mean, he, he, his idea of longer, John Longer, is when Tottenham wins the Premier League. That's how we. That's like. That's that's like. Then we speak how in, we put in, it out there in decades. Well, right. he's a British guy, not, but, not but years, what like, you heard there, folks, bottle it. That was a really point. important discussion. He was f absolutely fantastic, and in some ways, it speaks to the geopolitical tension in the moment as well. Yes. He's talking about central banks that have to push back against fiscal policy that just remains loose. The President of the United States about to make a formal request for $100 billion of resources to help Ukraine and to help Israel. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. I know these conflicts can seem far away. And it's natural to ask, why does this matter to America? Hamas and Putin represent different threats, but they share this in common. They both want to completely annihilate a neighboring democracy, completely annihilate it. The president of the United States, in a rare address to the nation, laying the groundwork for a formal $100 billion request to provide resources for Ukraine and Israel. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 pulling back just a touch all morning, down by 0.16% on the S&P. Yield to lower by six basis points, a 10-year 4.93. Crude rallying, second week of gains on the cards. We're back in the 90s, Tom. $90.60, WTI yeah. up by 1.4%. We're so focused on the bond market, we haven't talked about this, and so let's talk about it here. All of a sudden, we're at the 90 level. I haven't done the technical work, but the question simply is, how do you get to 100, and what does it take? And Certainly, it's news on the war, which 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 will drive that, and I, I think we have to watch it over the weekend. I mean, well, it's not about getting to Monday; it's about getting to Friday evening. Last year, we drained the SPR, and this year, the reason <coughs> sanctions on Venezuelan crude production. I'm not sure if that gets it done. Remember the Saudi cuts? Let's see at the review of those, Tom. I believe they are monthly. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this. And we'll it was see. you know Oliver Crook mentioning that there's going to be some form of Arab meeting in Cairo. I believe it's today or tomorrow. And, you know, those are the kind of meetings that, that this gets sorted out, which is the elephant in the room, what will the Saudis do? Crude was up 6% last week, TK. It's up a little more than 3% well, so far this week. We need a briefing right now. Anne-Marie Horton joining us now, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent, as we stagger through Friday and into the weekend. Anne-Marie, I want to play off a CNN poll that was done. I'm sure you've reviewed it, and it's like who's for Palestine, who's for Israel and all that. There is a single sentence in there that got my attention, and that is over the last decade, Israel's support of Democrats, I don't know what the right word is, has drifted or slipped or changed away. After the president's speech, discuss his party and their support for him. Yeah, over the decade, and Gallup had did this research, Tom, over the past decade, what we've seen is Democrats become a little bit more critical um, and skeptical of Israel. And it was this year where actually you do see uh, Democrats within America, their sympathies lie uh, with the Palestinian people. The president has been over the course of the past nearly two weeks making the case, and this is something he is deeply affected by. Uh, about the right for Israel to defend itself and how it is in the national security interests of the United States to make sure they are supporting Israel in their right to defend itself. Um, this is something the president really holds dear since he was a child. He talked about in a number yeah. of these speeches the fact that he would bring his children to view concentration camps. This is something that he personally is affected by, and he wanted to make that case to the American people yesterday. Emory, what is the task this weekend? I mean, uh, not so much the president, but the administration. Do they speak to the Saudis? Who's the number one phone call to? Well, I think they're talking to everyone at this moment. What I think the administration has to deal with right now uh, is the present danger to our men and women um, in Iraq, in Syria, on air bases, where uh, General Pat Ryder yesterday at the Pentagon talked about that they are coming under increased uh, fire. There's a lot more uptick in drone activity, as well as yesterday, the uh, destroyer in the Red Sea intercepted missiles and drones that were likely headed towards Israel from the Houthis. So this is going to be front and center for this administration and the Pentagon as we go into the weekend. Amory, you nailed it. The president had a purpose yesterday evening. So let's talk about that purpose, the follow through, a formal request, $100 billion in resources to help Ukraine, 
to help Israel and other issues on the agenda as well. And Marie, how does that happen without a speaker in the House? How is this going to work through the next few days and weeks? Well, it's a great question, Jonathan. Um, if you ask individuals who actually drafted the language of what a pro temp speaker does post 9-11, this was drafted for continuity of government, they will say that actually the pro temp speaker has the powers in a time to put something on the floor, especially if it has to do with an emergency situation. But the Republican Party, Jonathan, um, is chaotic right now, and we just don't know how they want to proceed yet. Jim Jordan is saying he's going to go to the floor for a third vote. He's going to be speaking at 8 a.m. Potentially we'll get a little bit of an update from him on whether or not he thinks he has a better chance. Likely it doesn't look like he has those votes. And we're once again Groundhog Day in Washington, D.C., and it's paralysis, really, on the House of Representatives. So it makes the president's request much more difficult. But by and large, you do see bipartisan support when it comes to supporting Israel. The president is casting a wide net here. He's including partners in the Indo-Pacific. He didn't mention China by name last night, but clearly he was talking about China and Taiwan. And also there's going to be money for the southern border. So there's something there for Democrats and Republicans alike. So when there is a speaker or potentially they give uh, a little bit more of a nudge to Patrick McHenry, the pro temp right now, to potentially put this on the floor, there will be the votes. And I'm sure President Biden doesn't, ma uh, ma uh, doesn't mind that much from at least a visual uh, perspective that there is disarray in the Republican Party. I am wondering, though, with Jim Jordan, why is he running again if it is very unclear whether he has the votes? Well, this is an individual who fiercely does not like to lose. Um, it's almost ingrained in him that he does not like to lose. And... You know, no one really, I think, at this moment is a clear win for the Republican Party to get to 217. Uh, one Republican I heard, um, Mr. Joyce, say no one in this party can even agree on the time of the day. So you can see how fractured the party is right now. And potentially, Congressman Jordan just thinks, you know, a third time is a charm. Maybe I could jawbone some of these individuals down to see my vision. The issue is this is actually starting to get a little bit of violent in, in the rhetoric. There's a number of congressmen, Don Bacon, he's come out saying his wife has gotten threatening text messages. I listened to a voicemail that CNN put out that was very disturbing. I mean, incredibly disturbing and chilling of what potentially some of these allies or individuals in Jordan's office are saying to congressmen and women and their families who oppose Jim Jordan. I'm not sure if that bullying is going to work. We'll see today at 10 a.m. There have been a number of uh, congressmen that have come out and said it's actually pushing them in the opposite direction. Anne-Marie, does this make it more or less likely that there'll be some sort of Speaker of the House supported by both parties, a sort of bipartisan type of character? I think the Republicans are going to exhaust all their measures, and then potentially you're going to tr see some wheeling and dealing on the Democratic side to get someone in place. Yesterday, we had thought that they were going to really try to expand the powers of Patrick McHenry. But when you came out of when the Republicans came out of that conference early in the morning, it was very clear that majority of the Republican Party did not want to go on that route. They wanted to make sure that they were able to elect a speaker. Um, at this time, it's really unclear the path forward, but there is that potential that we could see almost a power sharing within the House of Representatives if there's a more moderate centrist Republican that goes for the speakerships and gets Democrat votes. The issue is, in about one year's time, that individual will be up for re-election, and the hard right Republican Party is going to want to primary that person. MH, thank you. Anne-Marie, down in Washington, D.C., on the latest regarding the president's address to the nation yesterday evening. Tom, $100 billion. And within the $100 billion, you're talking about multiple causes. Yeah, The two most causes, prominent ones. Precisely. Israel and Ukraine. If you can get the support for Israel and you have that consensus in Washington, do you have the same consensus on Ukraine at the moment, particularly from the Republican side? I, I don't think you do. I, I think it's I a movable feast. I don't think you do. I'm not sure how easy this will be. This goes to the polling, including the Bloomberg poll of a few days ago, showing Mr. Trump uh, doing better than good in some key states as well. What's after the first 100? 50? Do you, go, do you do a harmonic spend or do you go to 200? Well, but and also just to pair this idea with the fact that there is no Speaker of the House. <clears throat> 
how political is the timing of this? Yes, they need the aid. They're not going to get it for a long period of time based on some of the dysfunction down in Washington, D.C. So how much is this aimed at pressuring some of the bipartisan members who do support both causes. And, yeah. and that, to me, is part of what I think we have to understand with the timing. Too. On the fringes of either party, you know you can get pushed back to Ukraine aid from the Republican side. You get pushed back to the Israeli aid as well from the Democratic side on the fringe of that party as well. It's really, really difficult right now I would suggest in Washington. the British phrase, they will be overcome by events. Let's try to get to Monday. We, we have been, haven't yeah. we, over yes. the last couple of weeks we in a big way. From New York City, up next, Deborah Cunningham of Federated Hermes on this market. What a bond market move so far this week. Your yield, 493.50. From New York, this is Bloomberg. We are on the longest daily losing streak in about a month on the S&P 500. Three days of declines on the Nasdaq. Your price action looks like this. We're down another two-tenths of one percent. Let's see if we make it day four on the Nasdaq. We're down a quarter of one percent. We have to confront developments in the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year cycle highs through the week. 493.50 on a 10-year. We're down about five basis points on the day within a basis point, within just one basis point of 5% a little bit earlier on a 10-year maturity, 499. Your 30-year, Lisa, even with a four basis point move lower, still comfortably above 5% this morning. Kind of speaking to the move we've seen higher in yield this week. We're at levels that we hadn't really gamed out that were kind of the worst case scenarios. The Bill Dudleys would come out and they would say something like, yeah, yields could get to this point and everyone would write these, you know, sort of dramatic headlines that yeah. everyone would then shrug off and say, that's not plausible. Here we are. And I think the biggest surprise is not that rates have gotten here here, but that it's that you have not seen a commensurate sell-off in risk assets to really pair that. that. That basically this has come with strength and ongoing strength and well, resilience that no one really imagined. Data's you, still good, right? Exactly. You guys are dead on here. Torsten Slack moments ago puts out a deck from Apollo and he says it's simple. The default cycle started. And that's something, Lisa, you've been following here. And the answer is garbage like auto delinquencies and the rest of it has really gotten ugly in the last month or two. But we're still not going to 2007 levels, 2008 levels. Are we, though? That's the question in terms of default. I don't know. You know, I, 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 I really don't know what to do with it. I was walking down the, the corridor at Marrakesh and there's Bill Dudley walking at me. How Bill was that? Can we stop for a moment and say, you know, it, sometimes you make the right call and it's not because you got the reason why. He's genius of the year. I mean, it's amazing so what Dudley's totally done. I always reflect on a conference that I did for Bloomberg, actually, <clears throat> back in the summer of 2021. I had two panelists. One was Bill. The other was Mohammed, And mm. they were both talking about the prospect that maybe inflation isn't transitory. Mohammed was really pushing the idea that there's some real two-way risk here we need to appreciate and we're not. This could well be the real deal, an inflationary problem that this Fed has to respond to aggressively. Fed's still doing <clears throat> QE. Got to remember the backdrop here. Rates are still zero, Fed's still doing QE. Continue doing QE for like the next nine months. Ridiculous. And then Bill comes out and he talks about how far Fed funds might have to go. Yeah. And he talks up a five handle. And I'm sitting there listening, Tom. We're still doing it virtually because it's still post-pandemic. That's how far, a virtual, this yeah. is how far back this was. Yeah. Sitting there thinking, Bramo, 5%, 5%. No chance. <laughs> and why not? Something's going to break. Exactly. And that you're going to see this rash of defaults that Slock says is coming, yeah. but it's just sort of on the margins. It hasn't become an existential risk. That's the bond market story. Let's get to the commodity market story right now. Crude, Brent, WTI, pushing higher through last week, again this week as well, up by 1.4% on the session. $90.60 WTI, Brent crude, $93 and about 60 cents. Under surveillance this morning, the US sending more forces to the Middle East, including fighter jets, as tensions flare in the Israel-Hamas war. Minor injuries were reported after U.S. bases in Syria and Iraq were targeted by drones yesterday. A U.S. destroyer also intercepted three missiles launched from Houthi militants in Yemen, believed to be headed in the direction of Israel. The risk here, Lisa, I think we all understand it and appreciate it now. The risk is that this becomes a broader conflict and maybe even, perhaps, and we all fear it and hope it doesn't happen, the U.S. gets pulled in. 
the frantic diplomacy that we have seen really highlights that. I thought it was interesting that Rishi Sunak met with the Saudi Arabian leaders in a way that the U.S. president could not, because all of those meetings had to be canceled after the explosion at the hospital. This, to me, highlights how concerned everybody is to, about a broader conflagration, and yet nobody has understood how to put the genie back in the bottle, especially given all the anger. And if you thought it would deliver some kind of sense of urgency in Washington, the answer to that is no. Congressman Jim Jordan continuing his bid to become the next Speaker of the House. Jordan expecting to hold a news conference at the top of the hour with a third vote set for 10 a.m. A measure to make Congressman Patrick McHenry the temporary Speaker, Tom, has failed. Yeah, I would watch Mr. Jeffries into the weekend. I think the gentleman from the Democratic Party, he is from New York City, and Mr. Jeffries, Congressman Jeffries, is, is going to be front and center here. If you go, let's assume it's a debacle. Pretty predictable right now. Okay, so it's a debacle. What do you do to get to Monday or the Sunday talk shows? And the answer is listen to the Democrats. A lot of stories off the radar at the moment. There were really like the story on the radar only a few weeks ago, including this one. General Motors and the United Auto Workers nearing a tentative deal to end the labor strike. Our notice. reporting here at Bloomberg saying the two sides are moving closer but still having disputes over pay and pensions. UAW President Sean Fain expected to give another one of those updates, oh. Lisa, a little bit later this morning. We'll get that at 10 a.m. I take your point that it's off the radar. It's sort of interesting that it is given how long it's gone on and how much this potentially could reduce the supply of cars and what does that do? Increase prices at a time when people are worried about inflation. To me this really does highlight how all of these micro factors continue to go on as people worry about sort of these exogenous risks and are the reasons why people still see strength, ongoing inflation and some of these other kinds of wage pressures that this really represents. Clearly, Tom, UAW feels like they've still got leverage, which speaks to that well, jobless claims number we got yesterday. What was it, sub 200? Yep. Yeah, they, it, sub 200 on claims. Yeah, stunning. It, it, it was really stunning. Continuing claims was what I guess they call quiescent. What I want to know is they got to get back to work because they got to compete with a cyber truck. Which is out in November, delivered, yeah, yeah delivery's you know, coming I out. I think, you know, they got to get back to that. Right now, we are going to give you a terrific brief, as we did before, on this bond debacle. She has lived it. Deborah Cunningham joins us, global liquidity market CIO at a massive bond house, Federated Hermes, with all of their experience at money market funds. Deborah, I'm not going to mince words. All my radar's up, and my lesson on radar is to go to trust in liquidity. Into the weekend, is there trust in the system? Is there liquidity within the system? There are both at this point, Tom. I think, you know, the, it, as Lisa was mentioning, this economy has a huge mosaic of factors that are inputs to what's happening in the overall market, you know, what the strength in the economy is, what the what the yield curves are doing, uh, currencies, all of those things. And ultimately, the liquidity markets and liquidity in the broader markets seems to still be resilient and have strength going into the weekend. Deborah, we were talking earlier in the show, at what point do we reach a tipping point where all of the investors who have just hoarded cash in 5% yielding funds start to say, you know what, we actually are worried about locking in some of uh, the repricing risk on the longer end of the curve. Have you started to see that on the margins? You know, Lisa, we challenge ourselves with that every single day. Should we get longer? Should we go into other products? Should our advice to clients be going into and locking in some of these longer yields? Um, and we think the beginning of that process has started to occur. Certainly, we've started to see some pickup from a bond flow perspective, um, but not in mass yet. And I think that's because we finally have a bond market. And, you know, we saw the statistics that are our, our 10-year, 30-year, 2-year, types of yields that are above or approaching 5%, uh, we finally have a bond market that is reconciled with the fact that the Fed speak out there for the last year, higher for longer, is truthful. It's what's happening. Don't expect something different. But Deborah, what do you make of the fact that we're not seeing some sort of race toward 10-year, 30-year bonds at 5% yields at a time of great geopolitical concern, at a time where people are looking for haven trades to protect against possible unrest? Does that send a pretty powerful and deeper signal to you? I think it's, it, it sends the signal that we're still not sure if inflation is reined in to the point where the Fed is comfortable in maintaining a yield that, you know, is 
for, for a, an extended period of time without going higher. Certainly, Chair Powell and other Fed speak is leaning in that direction. But we don't see, I, I don't think that what we're seeing from an inflationary perspective is 100% confirming of that. I mean, you were mentioning the, the auto strikes. That can be, um, you know, a negative from an inflationary perspective, both from a wage inflation as well as from a vehicle inflation. We don't know how that is going to impact us. Um, you have issues from, you know, the conflict in the Middle East. What does that do from an oil inflationary and an energy perspective? There are so many unknowns out there from an inflationary standpoint that I think people will continue to be tentative until some of the, you know, the, the fog in that picture starts to clear. Deborah, Friday, as you well know, in federated land means do Frank Fabozzi, the giant of teaching us about fixed income dynamics. Let's do it right now. The conceit into the end of the year is mark to market. We're not mark to market and we'll just hold it out to maturity. Baloney. It's just baloney. If I've got a 10 year piece, how far out is my break point where things fall apart, where the idea, the conceit of holding it forever falls to pieces? Well, it really depends on you know what what the coupon is on that ten year piece. You know, if it's a five percent coupon that you just bought recently or a four and a half, um, it's it's probably not that lengthy of a holding period. If it's something you bought a year or two ago and has you know yields that are a hundred, several hundred basis points below right. that, you're not you're not breaking even at any point in the near term. Um, you know, I think from a bond investor perspective it's hard to get off yield yield has been what has ruled the ruled the roost in in bond land okay. forever but total return is very very impactful and needs to be considered as well thank you this is incredibly important so let's go again to frank fabozzi and the idea that we are switching from a yield mindset to a price mindset how will that affect institutional bond buy side I think what you're going to see is resistance to that. Um, but as the resistance starts to fade, you'll you know, you'll you'll, pe you'll see people lumping back in to the bond market because what the downside risk is with yields above five percent is much less than the downside risks when 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 yields were at three percent. So coupon clipping from that part of the the the, the total return uh, should help get you through some of the price risk that you still may experience. All in all, though, you have to have a time frame that's longer than three to six months. You need to be thinking about something that's you know more in years for that type of thought process. Deborah, thank you. Deborah Cunningham, there, a Federated Hermes. Tom, it takes time to adapt and adjust, to borrow a phrase, from a wise man in a bow tie to what has taken place over the last couple of years. I, I, I can tell you, folks, I, I went through a couple bond debacles way back that were kid stuff compared to this. You just heard a massive jaded pro there, and the gentleman from BlackRock was Jean Bovin moments ago, yeah. his Bank of England experience. Folks, you're getting a snapshot here. Did you see how Deborah Cunningham was not stammering but choosing her words carefully? Locked in. Because... This shift from yield to price is really rare in the last 20 years. There's one security that I keep bringing up on the Bloomberg terminal, and it matures in 2050. Menu? It's a 30 year gilt that was issued in the summer of 2020. You taught me that, yeah. It's trading in the 30s. Yeah. Just to get your head around that, it's trading in the 30s. Yeah. I had a coupon, Tom, just looking at the numbers here. 0.625. We had two interviews just in the last two hours that, you know, their time frame is when the Tottenham wins the Premier League. It's all there is to it. Which is probably when that bond matures, Tom, in 2050. If yeah. you're just joining us, oh, welcome to the program. Hello, Daniel Levy. Your equity market <laughs> negative by 0.3%. Somebody tweeted out today, you know, let's try to take a moment here of joy. They, they went back and looked at our Christian Horner interview. Oh, right. And they're in Austin. What, what made them do that? I don't know. They're in Austin this weekend. They are, yeah. And I saw it, that. Explain to our American audience here. Well, maybe you the can. Symbol. You're the big fan now. No, I don't have a clue, but it, it's the same. It's a track you don't like. You don't like these modern Miami I don't like the newer tracks. tracks. I, didn't, I don't like Miami. I sort of remained, remain on a... I work out what I think about Vegas, all right? I'm trying to bite my tongue a little bit here. I don't like any of it. I really don't. I like the traditional stack tracks with a lot of heritage. I prefer that. Yeah. So I, I like sort of your, your Monaco's. 
Hungary, Spa, Belgium, okay. Monza, Italy, Silverstone, of course, yeah. in the UK. That's my preference. That's about I'll all reserve the, judgment. It's all the, right? about all the light chat we can have. The events here this week have been exhausting. We've got to go right back to the bond market and, you know, yen at 150 and the rest of it. Which almost makes me need a vacation to some of those places, which sounds like a better vacation than some Wouldn't other places. Wouldn't that be amazing? Jerry Halliwell does that now, right? Goes around. Because she's married to Christian Horner, so go. just goes around to, you know, do the, all yeah. of the, do the tour. If I won the lottery, yes. without doubt, I would do the tour. And that would be me for the year. Your co-host with you, so we could do the show there. No, I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd retire, phone in, see what you're up to, that kind of thing. Uh, from Monaco, that'd work. That'd work. Like that. Then all of a sudden, are you going I'd, to Vegas? I'd love these. Are new you going to then, Vegas? How many, how many lotto, Vegas? How many lotto tickets have you bought recently? Have I don't you bought gamble, here? Brammer. I'm not a gambler. No gambling for me. But if you did. experienced the hell of 9-11, we felt enraged as well. While we sought and got justice, we made mistakes. So I caution the government of Israel not to be blinded by rage. Not the first time we've heard that from this president this week. President Joe Biden in an address to the nation, trying to find a bit of balance there with those comments. From New York City, welcome to the program on the S&P 500, pulling back by a quarter of 1%, yield to lower by four basis points, 4.9435 on a 10-year crude rallying all week, up for a second consecutive week, up by 1.4% and back in the 90s on WTI. Tom, $90.60. And the oil uh, lifting up here. Interesting to see off news flow where we'll be. And I'm not, after talking to Oliver Crook, John, I'm not really sure I understand the news flow into the weekend in Israel. I think it is completely unknown. I keep going back to something I've said, Tom, a few times this week. Going into last weekend, seemingly on the brink of a full ground invasion. Feels like something's changed in the last few days. Something's changed. I agree. Lisa, what do you think At this week of very intense diplomacy, Bramo, and we've had leader after leader visiting Israel, and it just feels like that timeline's been pushed out somewhat. And there's a question around what the objectives are and a greater focus on what things will look like in Gaza after this whole uh, explosion of and tensions really uh, ends. There's also an issue of how much we are dragging other regions into the conflict and how that's becoming a real, a real issue and a real threat. We're going to begin now with a really delicate conversation with the gentlelady from Michigan. Haley Stevens is a Democrat from Michigan. Of course, it's a Michigan of Dingle, Debbie Dingle, and the rest. But it's also a Michigan that shows the immigrant demographic and makeup of America. Haley, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. As you know, the Arab community coming off of 1947, 1948 in Michigan is Dearborn, Michigan. You don't represent that, but you've got to live with a heterogeneous Michigan right now. What is the support for the president in a fractious Michigan? Well, I would be able to tell you more if I wasn't trapped in Washington waiting to vote for a speaker. But look, I think people are heartbroken about what has taken place um, in the Middle East. They are heartbroken over the terrorist attack on Israel. Uh, certainly, uh, our Muslim community is feeling, as the president said, the uh, unfortunate reminders of what took place, the targeted violence that took place towards their community in the wake of 9-11. And this is a moment, just as mm -hmm. our president did last night, to show compassion to really talk about who we are as Americans, that we are a welcoming place of diversity. And we do celebrate our Jewish community in Michigan who is hurting right now and, right. and tell them to be proud of who they are. And we celebrate and recognize our Arab and Muslim community in Michigan and tell them to be proud of who they are. All are welcome right. in this country. The shift here, Haley, in Michigan is a perfect crucible for this. It's from John Dingle and Debbie Dingle in the support of the Democratic Party for Israel, which is our Anne-Marie Horton says, has ebbed away. And that tension outside Detroit is an image, a, a small piece of the American debate right now. How will you represent that debate in the House if and when you finally get a House that's organized? Well, I've been very clear about standing by democracy. And what we heard from the president last night needing to support Ukraine, needing to support Israel. Certainly Armenia is on our minds as well with autocratic attacks coming from Azerbaijan. 
I sit on the select committee on competitiveness with the Chinese Communist Party. It is very clear to me that this marker in time is about democracy versus autocracy. I am not calling for war, but I am saying that free markets, capital markets, and open democratic societies need to continue to lead the free world. And if we do not stand by our allies, if we do not stand by the only democracy in the Middle East and find a path to peace, that that is where we need to go. And that is where I'm going to vote, that is where I'm going to support, and I am going to continue to be there at the same time for all of my constituents. I have been very clear about my views on supporting democracy, on supporting Israel, as well as Ukraine at this time. Do you think that your uh, fellow Congresswoman from Michigan, Rashida uh, Taleb, is showing that compassion and helping the cause? I'm not here to talk about any of my other colleagues. You're asking me about my position and where I plan to vote as, as a member of Congress. Our Michigan delegation is small, it is mighty, and we work together on a multitude of issues. I don't agree with all of my colleagues on, on their issues, but I will say that I am planning to support the president's call for support for Ukraine and support for Israel. I was just in Israel in August. I was at Kafar Aza. I was looking out on the Gaza Strip. I was hearing about how 20,000 people come in daily to work in Israel, how all people want are, is peace. And we do need to find those pathways. We've got a modern president in Joe Biden with a vision for the future and a vision for a path to supporting our allies and finding peace. And that is where I'm going to be focused. A lot of people are wondering how quickly Congress can act because of some of the dysfunction, the fact that there isn't a speaker right now. A question of whether Patrick McHenry could potentially get bipartisan votes to be at the helm. Would you vote for Patrick McHenry? I am going to vote along the lines of how we get out of this in a bipartisan way. Right now, I'm on the Problem Solvers Caucus. You know, certainly our discussions are, are private at this time. I, I think empowering a, you know, as Hakeem Jeffries put forward yesterday, and we thought that the Republicans were with us, a temporary speaker pro tem to get us out of this mess. I will say the day that Kevin McCarthy respond, uh, resigned as speaker, I said that we might be in a national security crisis and this is a threat to our country. And then on Saturday, we woke up to the devastating news of the terrorist attack on Israel. We, we, we are feeling the attentions back at home. We are feeling the worry. The House cannot be shut down. We're in over two weeks of this mess right now. I want to get out of it. I do, we cannot see our government shut down. The, the funding has got a deadline less than a month from now. That would obviously be catastrophic. So whatever it takes. Mr. Jordan appears stubborn and intent on moving forward when he clearly doesn't have the support. Uh, bipartisan support or the support that he needs within his caucus. And what we've seen this entire term, this this has been going on since way earlier than Kevin McCarthy's uh, being pushed out as speaker. Republicans are not in agreement with each other. Republicans are blocking Republicans from passing Republican legislation. We are in shared government. We've got a Democrat as president of the United States who's known for being bipartisan. We've got a small majority in, in the Senate. Yeah. We've got Chuck Schumer who's doing the work. We got to get our acts together. The adults need a lead right now. This sounds like a campaign pitch, Congresswoman. How are you going to work in a bipartisan manner if you're unwilling to address the division in your own party? I don't know about what division you're talking well, about. Well, let me in my highlight it right now. I'll give you the quote. Rashida Tlaib, Israel just bombed the Baptist hospital, killing 500 Palestinians just like that. Tweet's still up. You can read it. It's different to what you think, isn't it? So we're talking about the speaker, and no. we're talking about 212 people are voting for Hakeem You're Jeffries, talking about that, he's... not what I'm talking about. I just referenced the quote. You said you're willing to address the division in your party. Let's do it right now. Why is that tweet still up? That is one voice. I do not control another member of Congress. I have been very clear about where I stand. We can see the votes time and time again 
400 plus members in this bo very body voting to support Israel, voting to support the Iron Dome. Those are my positions. I, I, I could sit here and try and argue with Jim Jordan, argue with Matt Gates, argue with the people who have different viewpoints that represent a very small minority. Look, the intelligence is out there about what happened with the hospital. I'm listening to Israel. I'm listening to the U.S. And your democratic and colleague, and so is my and so is my democratic leader, my friend. Your democratic colleague isn't listening to it. Based on that, she isn't, and you've got nothing to say about it, which is pretty amazing. I just said my position, sir. I, I just have you said spoken to your democratic colleague? I, we have all spoken, and my, our leadership has spoken, and our president spoke last night. I really don't understand what we're debating here. Haley Stevens, thanks for being with us. Congresswoman from Michigan. TK. This is the debate, and to the congressman's, congresswoman's uh, credit, there is a tradition that you don't criticize other congresspeople. That is an ironclad uh, agreement across a party that goes back well in excess of 200 years. With that said, it is Michigan is a crucible of these demographics. Like from New York City, your equity market is slightly negative. We're down a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. From New York, this is Bloomberg. People are looking for safety alternatives. To me, look, bonds now yield something. They offer real value. The further the yields rise, the greater the chance that a slowdown is going to be even deeper. Consumer spending is starting to soften, but it's not broad enough yet that it's falling off a cliff. We could keep up a sustainable pace that looks a lot like, if not a little better, than where we were before the pandemic. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Brown, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. An exhausting week, an extraordinary Friday. We welcome all of you on economics, finance, investment, on international relations in a fractured Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Lisa, we're all exhausted. I think we've got to start with the bond market. It's been a huge theme through the morning. It's just simple. Yields stay up, sustained, and prices down. Somehow, the idea of post-2007 highs has lost its power. It's lost its punch. We've gotten sort of benumbed to this idea like of that. this immeasurable yeah. climb higher. The question now is, how <clears throat> high can it go? Do we basically have this sudden uh, skepticism that we can get back to anything close to what we used to know. This idea that, yes, you can leg into longer-term bonds because at some point, you'll like the idea of 5%. The yields. question to do with your diminished wealth, if you're not in the triple leverage dog cash fund, we've got an important guest coming up here on multi-asset translated linkage between equities and bonds uh, right now. I want to get to the international in, in a minute, but we've been completely devoid this morning, Lisa, on the equity markets, and there's American Express is some form of clarion signal that no one's paying attention to. Record revenues. We're talking about record profits, people coming and paying for the luxury of whether it's going to a Sky Club or whether it's the other perks that American Express offers. But what this highlights is just, again, that the well-heeled individuals are not hurting. And you can see that again and again. American Express share is not doing much in, in pre-market trading. But these numbers... <clears throat> are right. really stunning, given how much you already had baked into these shares. Third quarter, earnings per share, $3.30 versus the estimate of $2.95. That's a simple look back. I'm going to look forward and say double-digit plan there. Of, well, double-digit. I'm, I'm overdoing it. 10% was a modeled plan, but 7% core growth. And, and these are numbers that come from a sprightly economy. And that's, again, within this horrific bond news flow, the horrific news that we see out of the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm sorry, the American GDP statistic is solid. Here's where things get con uh, really kind of rather confusing, especially in the permacrisis world uh, that Mohammed Ali and others have written about, people are expecting defaults to pick up, <clears throat> suddenly the whole world collapses. You're seeing actually the bad loan charge-offs in American Express increasing, going beyond what people previously expected. They're just making so much money on the other side that they offset that. And this highlights where we are. Yes, there are people struggling, there are people not paying their bills, there are companies that are defaulting. 
but that is not well, torpedoing the broader economy in the way that it has traditionally, at least in the 2007-2008 to, to channel Batman's friend Marty Fritzen, holy Marty Fritzen, and the answer is the default season has clicked in here. Torsten Slack at Apollo out with a deck this morning. We're not going to quote it now. we got to get out. My bow tie. I can't do anything with my bow tie today. On radio, it looks terrible. And the answer is Slack. A default cycle has started. Bramo, discuss. Well, it has started, but how far will it go? He writes, a default circuit has started with bankruptcy filings rising and default rates will continue to rise over the coming quarters, impacting in particular middle market companies. This goes to something you've talked about extensively, Tom. How much does the lower tier of players, whether it's smaller <coughs> businesses or whether it's less wealthy households, right are going to have a completely different reality than the rest of America. And how much do we see that really, that divergence widen out? Lots of narratives away from the market and away from the Eastern Mediterranean. And Mr. Jordan of Ohio is speaking right now with flags assembled behind him. And it's very simple. This is, Lisa, help me here because I can't keep count. I'm not like Horton. Horton just memorizes his stuff. It's his third, third vote today. Yes, it's his third vote. And he said that originally he waffled. He said he'd throw his support right. behind Patrick McHenry. And then, no, oh. he's not going to give up. Uh, this amid a lot of controversy and accusations of threatening right. voicemails and texts to the J other Republican Congress members. Yeah, Joe Matthew and Amory Horton following this, I'm sure a terrific sum tonight on a three hour version of Analysts of Power. I think that's I'm what sure they're going to very happy that you to just do. assigned We're going to tackle work. the data check right now. Oil elevated off of, I'm going to be certain, missile strikes from Yemen moving some vicinity north towards Israel or other uh, points. I got Brent Crude was giving me some 94 uh, love. The answer is we've come back to a 93 handle, 93.43. Bond market uh, it's real simple. I'll just say this, Lisa. The real yield is where I never imagined it. I had a 250 walking in the door this morning. It's 247 right now. I have never framed a 247 modern 10-year real yield. I am so glad you brought this up. This is the inflation-adjusted yield. And this speaks to what Jay Powell said yesterday with our own David Weston when he came out and said, what's driving longer-term yields for, uh, higher? He didn't really uh, give you any kind of conclusive answer, but he did say it doesn't seem to be driven by rising inflation expectations. Yeah. It is risen by something else, rising deficits, rising uh, you know, uncertainty about the uh, demand bid at a time when you yeah. have paid places in Japan and China pulling back. Global Wall Street watches us, listens to us for the things below the narrative. Here's a tea leaf, Credit Suisse, and no, it's not the UBS rationalizations and layoffs. The major fund, real estate fund of Credit Suisse has dropped. They've repriced it negative. I don't think it drops. I made, I, I made that. It's my fault, folks. Not accurate. They've repriced it. It's, a rep it's like a Tesla price, <laughs> price cut down 9%. Price is lower, yet not necessarily for selling. <clears throat> and that, I think, is going to be the key. When do we see forced selling and realization of the losses at a time when people are seeing sort of paper right. losses mount? The tension here, the VIX, 20 Point nine one, With experience and a wonderful clarity of note at Newberger Berman, Eric Knudsen joins this morning. Multi-asset class CIO, that means he's been there longer than 10 years and he joins us uh, again amid this tumult. What does the bond debacle mean, Eric, for stocks? Well, good morning, and, and uh, it's always a pleasure to join you, especially when I'm being followed by a quote of both Batman and Torsten Slock in the same sentence. So, I mean, I think first and foremost, this is a time for humility in, in multi-asset investing, and there is such a divergence between short-term economic information, including earnings, which are coming in quite you know, nicely, short-term GDP growth expectations, unemployment, consumer behavior, as you said, as reflected in the Amex, uh, earnings with much higher interest rates, uh, much higher, um, you know, stickier inflation and the, you know, crises around the world and in Washington, et cetera. And, and what this highlights is a time where we want, we don't want to make big beta bets in terms of big market exposure moves, but we want to be what we call long the strong, focused on quality within equities, within fixed income, in private markets, real estate, where there are some now interesting opportunities as real estate gets repriced, um, as you see. Uh, and that's where we're seeing interesting opportunities right now. Eric, there was an interesting question raised uh, earlier this week about how much of these repriced assets are actually for sale. When you go out and you try to buy things at a discount, can you find them? 
Um, there's still, you know, a pretty good sized bid ask gap in in private markets when you're looking to engage in this activity. Um, that said, the, the pricing where markets are clearing when things sell are becoming more and more interesting. Average secondary pricing in private equity markets is 90 cents on the dollar. Real estate even more attractive and. And, you know, for our clients who can lock up capital in longer term investments, we think the ability to provide liquidity right now, whether it's in private credit or secondaries, uh, where you can solve problems for distressed investors, not distressed assets, is one of the interesting opportunities right now in this quite, you know, confusing overall environment. This is an interesting trend that I've heard a lot about. Basically, uh, the new distressed debt bet is not to wait for a company files for bankruptcy. It's to go to the CFO and say, you know, you got to refinance in two years and you're going to have a problem on your hand if rates are at this level. So let's figure out how to extend your maturities, add some certain protections, and you can give us secured assets and change around some of the structures. How much is that extending this cycle far beyond what people expected in terms of the effects of monetary policy? It's one of the aspects. As banks and traditional providers of liquidity have pulled back, and you've seen the the slews and other information indicating that bank standards are tightening, you know, lending lending activity is down. A lot of that is moving to the private markets, where where private markets investors don't have to mark to market on a regu- as regularly. They can take longer term time horizons, and there's a lot of additional capital that can help kind of buffer some of these impacts. I think the other thing that's going on is if you give corporate management a year to prepare for the most predicted recession, they can actually mitigate a fair amount of the impact of the impending recession. Earnings were down 6 to 7% for the S&P 500 in the first half of this year. Normally, when you see the kind of decline of growth we've seen from last year, you know, from a year and a half ago to this year, that would have been down 10, 15, 20%. And now you're seeing earnings kind of surprisingly, or perhaps not, you know, bouncing in the short term. Our focus is on companies that can weather an environment of slowing economic growth, sticky right. inflation, and higher interest rates. Eric, is that big tech? And right now, with the load the boat on big tech, PEs of 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever the number is, what we're doing is we're betting out our comfort out two years, three years, five years. Are we going to get run over doing that? Well, I think it, certainly some of the, the, the magnificent stuff and the big cap tech names that have been leading the market are certainly fully valued. That said, those companies are extraordinary. Uh, most of them are extraordinary in terms of the quality of their operations, the amount of cash they have, their debt levels, which are low and have been termed out. They're actually experiencing an improvement in financial conditions as interest rates rise. So we, we don't want to ignore those companies, but we need to be you know, sensitive to, to valuation. Um, where we're trying to, you know, where we see opportunity is down the cap spectrum, but away from kind of the broad index exposures, say in the Russell 2000, which is a pretty junky benchmark, and finding high quality companies. And the same is true on the fixed income side, where we now like bonds in the two to seven year maturity range right. from treasuries to corporates to asset packs. Eric, this has been a great brief. Thank you so much. Eric Hamilton with uh, years of experience at Newberger Berman enjoying this bond uh, debacle. On that note, choose 10 spread. Look at that, Lisa. I did not see this number all morning. It was buried. The choose 10 spread, are we beginning to talk about disinversion completely? You're OMG. To, well, you're starting to see it in the 5 to 30 year yeah. and the 5 to 10 year kind of spread. This sort of disinversion is not what people wanted to see in terms of the predicate, predecessor to some sort of economic success. S&P futures negative 11 down two tenths of a percent. Coming up, as we parse through how much to focus internationally versus domestically, I think that's been one of the biggest challenges, Tom, uh, that we've been dealing with all week. How do you parse the human tragedy going on in the Middle East with domestic strength? How do you pair ideas of people looking at what the tea leaves are at a time where there suddenly are even bigger tail risks on either side? Well, the tail risks were evident last night with a missile attack uh, from Yemen. We talked about that. Uh, earlier, but but to the point of you know folks just getting through the day, or far more importantly, getting to Monday, we've got the humanitarian discussion in place. The diplomatic discussion, I think, is in place. 
we don't have the military discussion in place. That is, and Oliver Cook, I thought, was quite good on this from Tel Aviv. That is the mystery in his Tel Aviv on a Friday afternoon. And the other mystery, at least for people in, uh, in the market right now, is oil and where prices go, especially in light of this tension around Iran's fingerprints and yet no direct <clears throat> accusations right. and how much that's really uh, behind the scenes, what could boil over in a more material way. A hallmark statistic, and Jonathan Farrow's been out front on this, and this is the idea I'm saying, folks, is look beyond the great financial crisis. The United Kingdom, 30-year guilt, pricing out right now, back to a summer of 1998. That is absolutely extraordinary. The yield the highest in London since 1998. Coming up, a piercing essay in The Telegraph in London. Former Ambassador to the United Nations, John Bolton, on the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm going to send to Congress an urgent budget request to fund America's national security needs, to support our critical partners, including Israel and Ukraine. It's a smart investment that's going to pay dividends for American security for generations. From another generation, perhaps, the President of the United States speaking to the nation last evening. We advanced that discussion this morning. Lisa, I thought the conversation with Stevens of Michigan was extraordinary. She is of the President's party, and the balances of a fractious Democratic Party was evident, to say the least. Both parties are very fractured right now, which raises a question That's of how brilliant, much brilliant. Of how much the U.S. has the capacity to get people to agree on some of these key measures that the president was trying to get people to coalesce around last night. And that, I think, is one of the main challenges right. that he's dealing with, both within his party as well as within the Republican Party. And marie uh, sending me, Emory Horton, folks, of Balance of Power, sending me a survey, I believe from Pew or Gallup. I can't remember, to be honest. I'm so sorry. But it really shows the tilt here in the nation, not so much towards a Palestinian temperament, but away from the certitude of an Israeli mood. It was a Gallup poll uh, and basically saying that the net sympathy for uh, for yeah. Israel had gone below 50 percent among Democrats. Yeah. And this is sort of what the tension is underpinning right. some of these debates. We thank Congresswoman Stevens for a tense interview. Right now, always tense is Greg Vallier, our chief U.S. policy strategist at AGF Investments. His note in the morning's early is a must read. Greg, it's not a layup in a fractured Congress. We just heard the gentleman from Ohio speak moments ago. We heard some of the tensions there from the Democrat Stevens of Michigan as well. What will be the process to deliver $100 billion to three or four projects? It could take a while, Tom. I mean, I think the case for aid to Israel and Ukraine is self-evident. But apparently that's that's not a view shared by a lot of people on Capitol Hill. The problem is things are so dysfunctional in the House. Without a House speaker, it could take weeks before Israel and Ukraine get more assistance. And I think the signal that we'll be sending to our allies and our adversaries is not a very good one. Howard Baker could get together with Tip O'Neill, just as one example. Is right. there any ability to get the center tendency to meet in the middle aisle? I think eventually that will happen. Eventually the center will hold. Uh, Mitch McConnell will play a role in this. Uh, there are plenty of people in both parties who feel strongly we've got to spend more money on both of these these horrible conflicts. But it's going to get dragged out. The, the next deadline that I look at is November 17th. That's when we got to get a budget. And if they don't get a budget, they're going to have to do another extension, probably past Christmas into late winter. If we have to wait that long for aid to Israel, that's uh, that's very troubling, in my opinion. Greg, we're talking about a new level of dysfunction, as some people have pointed out. Anne Marie was talking about some of the threats that have gotten actually violent to some of the center tendency Republicans who are not voting for Jim Jordan. Is there a precedent for this type of thing? Well, during the Civil War, there have been very you know, emotional periods in the country's history, Vietnam War. But but this is an embarrassment. Uh, what's going on in the in the House is a cringe-inducing to see this kind of dysfunction. And, and I think that 
again, our, our foreign allies and adversaries have to be looking at the U.S. thinking that we're starting to go off the rails. How much do you think that this is actually one of the drumbeats that has led up to multiple nodes of conflict that are permeating in many places around the world? This idea that there is increasing fracture around the governments, and I'm thinking in the U.S., I'm thinking in Israel, uh, with the uh, prime minister being incredibly controversial, I'm thinking about in other places as well. Yeah, I, I think that it makes a lot of countries around the world less inclined to wholeheartedly support us, thinking how dependable is the U.S.? Is what we're seeing in the House going to be standard behavior? Uh, again, I, I, I think we're going down a very risky path. Right now, we're actually anticipating something from a meeting between the European uh, Commission and the European Union presidents, as well as President Biden today. How closely are you watching that to understand just how close this connection is, even with some of the disagreements over trade and steel? I think they'll say all the expected things. I, I think they'll try to paper over their differences. But I think, think privately, uh, there's going to be a real candor saying the U.S. has to be concerned about the way that we're perceived right now. Uh, Greg Villiers, we have John Bolton coming up, always controversial. Yeah. He's been a magnet for debate and controversy in America. And in an essay here, he really centers away from the trauma of Gaza, the immediacy of Gaza, towards a triangulation of Gaza, West Bank, and the northern border of Israel, and alludes to Iran's ring of fire. Yep. What is the debate in Washington over what to do about Iran? I don't, I don't observe one. I, I think it's, it started last weekend, the Wall Street Journal's weekend publication, which is great, it's a must read, talked about the need for regime change in Iran. Uh, you're starting to hear people talk about that. That's very risky. But I, I think there's a growing Wrong. feeling that, that the Iranians are the provocateurs to a certain extent uh, for Hezbollah and for Hamas. Greg, that didn't work out in uh, uh, Baghdad a few decades ago. Yep. I mean, it seems like yesterday for you and me, but we don't prosecute regime change very well, do we? No, but it's perhaps a lesson not learned. Uh, in fact, I would guarantee you, Tom, that in your interview with Bolton, if you ask him about the, the possibility or the need for regime change, he will advocate it. I mean, Lisa, to me, this is just absolutely extraordinary. And it's what Ambassador Bolton is doing, whatever anyone's politics is, is trying to get beyond the shock of the immediacy of Gaza. And that is, what do we reformulate with Iran three months from now, six months from now? five years from now. Regime change is uh, a bit dramatic at a time when a lot of people are wondering just where the actual people stand. A lot of people have been protesting the Iranian administration. I am curious, though, Greg, from your vantage point, how much oil plays into this and the unwillingness of the U.S. to really go after Iran. We were speaking with Dan Tenenbaum earlier this morning, and he said that's a key measure. It's a key reason why the U.S. hasn't taken a harder line. Is that your view as well? I think that's a factor. I think another big factor, Lisa, is how fragile support is if the U.S. got even more involved uh, with the naval cruisers and a lot more weapons for Israel. I think a lot of U.S. voters, especially young people, are lukewarm at best uh, toward getting involved in this. So how much did President Biden's speech last night hearken to a different time and speak to a different yeah. audience than the mainstream that will be voting in the upcoming election? You know, Lisa, I just kept thinking one thing. Lyndon Johnson, uh, back in the late 60s, who made a case to confront uh, Vietnam, North Vietnam, it, it didn't succeed. He failed politically. And we've got another big primary only about a year away, maybe 14 months away, uh, up in New Hampshire. I think if uh, Robert Kennedy does well, if, if Joe Biden doesn't do well, there's going to be speculation that the war is an albatross for the Democrats and might warrant a, a look at whether Biden should stay on the ticket. Greg Vallier, thank you so much with AGF Investments. My head is spinning. There's just no other way to put it. I mean, what we have seen in the last two weeks dovetailed into the financial markets, which I'm going to suggest were already challenged before these military events, these tragic events. Uh, it, it's just amazing on this Friday to wonder where we'll be. I mean, get me to Monday or how about a week from Friday? Get me to the jobs report on uh, early November. 
Bear with me because I'm thinking in real time, but it seems like we've seen a number of uh, examples of how there has been sea changes in the status quo that we used to understand. U.S. Treasuries as a haven asset this week. That has been something that seems to have been challenged. This idea as the Democratic Party as being stalwart Israel supporters, we've seen that challenged. We've also seen the idea of just some sort of global unity at a time of incredible fractiousness, uh, both internationally as well as domestically. Engaged, yeah. There are all of these basic tenets that are being challenged on a regular basis that were really brought to the fore oh. this week, which is the reason why it's been a particularly confusing soup. What we have here on the Bloomberg terminal is the market uh, adjustment of this, the market action. Futures deteriorating actually in the last number of minutes, S&P futures down at 20. We have uh, dollar strength as you would expect, moments away from a 150 Japanese yen, sort of a Pacific Rim uh, measurement there. And I'm sorry, the 210 spread, massive disinversion over the week. We are only 17 basis points away from the twos and the tens having the same yield. Mirror Pandit, JP Morgan, we do that next. surveillance, Lisa Bramwitz and Tom King. John Farrell on assignment. He's getting ready for Austin, Formula One. <laughs> yeah, is that where he's going? I think, I think he's going somewhere else. He's got the surve I know he has a golf stream this weekend, so maybe he's going to pop down to Austin. We will see. John Farrell in the 9 o'clock hour. Did I hear a rumor that the gentleman from Cambridge will uh, be with John? Yeah, Mohamed Alarian, and maybe. Yeah, good to see you him. know, I got to say, on his trip around the world, he's going to struggle to really borrow to finance it. How do you like that segue? That's, <laughs> That's very, good. very good. Yeah. Right now, I just want to say that we are seeing 30 years year Treasury yields climb to the highest levels, new post-2007 highs. US, U.S. Treasury yeah, yields. Yeah, but elsewhere as well. U.K. 30-year bond yields to the highest since 1998. Right. We're back to 07, and I don't know if it's August 07, third week of August before or after. I'm going to guess it's on that spot. Uh, good morning, David Malpass and the late Alan Meltzer. Or back to 98, Lisa, which uh, August of 1998 was sport is how I would in the United Kingdom. Well. Either way, this is really the theme and the drum beat that we've seen in markets. Tape. Deteriorating yeah. tape as people assess both the chance for more borrowing as well as a strong US economy. There we are. It's uh, interesting to say the least. We're going to continue here on what you need to do to think Friday into this great bond debacle. But first, uh, Lisa, you want, you demand, you're pounding the <laughs> Bramo table saying, Herman, get Herman. <laughs> well, actually, I kind of was. Part of this whole thing, we made this big deal about uh, big bank earnings, and we always do. But this particular earnings season, it's the smaller banks that matter arguably more. And we do get a slew of earnings today. Herman Chan, following them all, senior U.S. regional banks analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. I just want to start there. We've got a slew of bank earnings. we got Comerica, Regions, Hunt Huntington. After the bell, uh, we hear from one of the more troubled of the banks, Western Alliance. What are we learning? It's a mixed picture across the board. Um, there is um, some optimism that maybe net interest margins have bottomed or will bottom in the fourth quarter. So that's positive as interest rates stabilize, um, at least on the short end. Um, on the other hand, the banks are still feeling the fallout of higher interest rates and the repercussions of uh, March and April. So repercussions meaning tougher regulations, that is driving uh, less lending across the regional bank space. So you're seeing loan growth decline. You're seeing deposits actually stabilize, which is great to see, but they're paying up for those deposits to stabilize the funding base. There's a real existential question here that John's been good about highlighting, which is, is Bank of America truly the Bank of America? Or right. is this the bank of uh, higher wealth individuals mm -hmm. and better capitalized companies right. to immunize potential risk? Right. The banks of America, are they showing the stress that we're hearing about in the beige book. It's it's interesting because asset quality has has been fairly stable. Um, you're seeing some weakness in areas like commercial real estate, and that's starting to pop up, but nothing to really drive loan losses at this point. So that's going to be more of a story for next year and the year after. That's right where I wanted to go. I've got the the S and P Regional Bank Index, the KRE, down 48 percent from a spiky peak. Right. On a moving average basis, it's almost back to COVID lows. Mm -hmm. And the question off of Credit Suisse, another regional bank. Uh, today, marking down their real estate portfolio 9%. How do these people actually mark down a busted office complex in Topeka? 
Right. So there, there's not a lot of price discovery as what exactly. your question's alluding to. So that's something that the banks are still trying to work through. What they're doing is they're increasing their allowance for, for the office and, and other areas that are tougher to, to sort of figure out at this point. So we're talking about an 8 9% reserve against, against these office um, commercial real estate projects. So that's, that's actually a pretty healthy number uh, compared right. to, and then underwriting has been fairly conservative. So it does seem like the banks are, are protected against potential yeah. losses, but there is still a lot of uncertainty. The stock chart doesn't look like that. Right. I'm sorry. Herman Chan, thank you for the brief this morning. Somehow I think we'll be speaking with Mr. Chan here uh, in the coming uh, months. You know, I'm in triple leveraged all cash. It's just really, really worked out over the last couple. Of, you know, I got a 2 and 20 payout going, and, you know, it's, I'm the only one. It's brutal. Well, it's brutal for, for some people. However, at the same time, there has been strength underlying a lot of this. The fact that we're talking about weakness in the shares of some of these banks, yet resilience in deposits and other issues underscores the challenge right now to understand the bond market moves. And, you know, Mira Panda, Panda over at J.P. Morgan Asset Management has been covering this, has been discussing this, has been trying to understand the relationship, the new relationship between bonds and stocks. What do you make of the relative resilience in equities this week to the moves that we're seeing in bond yields? And the weakening that we're seeing along around the margins, as Herman was just talking about. Clearly, 5% yields are a bit of a ceiling for the equity market. We've been waiting to find exactly what that ceiling seems to be, and I think that's where we are with 5% rates. But the challenge is not necessarily where yields are um, because growth is still so strong. I mean, 18 months ago, two years ago, if I told you in the fall of 2023, Policy rates will be above 5%, but economic growth will be tracking above 5%. We wouldn't know what to make of it. And so if you link that stronger economic activity with earnings and earnings being well-supported by that, then what you're seeing is some well-supported equity markets for now. The challenge is, as we look forward to next year with 12% earnings growth expected, that's pretty lofty. Maybe we'll see something closer to 6 or 7%. But if the U.S. economy slows, if some of these headwinds that are challenging consumers continue to materialize, that's going to challenge some of those expectations for profits. And that in and of itself could be a bigger challenge for the equity markets going forward. Are you getting any clarity from the companies that are reporting earnings? Are you getting the sense that they have a vision forward of what their corporate outlooks are going to be next year? It's, it's mixed. On the one hand, it's been great to, to forecast a recession for 18 months because it means that companies have had 18 months to prepare from an expense, from a headcount standpoint, to really bolster where they're getting their revenue and, and really assess their consumer segments. Um, on the other hand, look, we don't know necessarily how next year is going to play out, and I think the bank earnings were very telling. Usually what you'll hear from financial companies is, here's right. how we're thinking about recession risk. But instead, what we really heard was, here's how we're thinking about the big, meaty, existential macro risks from geopolitics right. to federal finances. So it was very interesting to hear them a little bit less focused on what does 2024 do as opposed to what is the era that we are entering. What are your clients, high net worth institutions, people with a pot of gold, how are they responding to these bond losses? Are they going to cash? Are they running? What are they, are they buying doubloons? What are they doing? It's been really challenging to have multiple down years for the bond market. and Three years down plus is on the Bloomberg Total Return Index. Absolutely. And I think that people need to reconsider their fixed income what allocations. What are they doing? I want to know on a Friday morning, are they, you know, the, the calls you're having, they're swearing at Bob Michael, et cetera, et cetera. What are they actually doing with these bond losses, writing them out? Essentially some of that, but I think that a lot of our clients were not positioned heavily in long duration yet. I think a lot of people were waiting for the entry point, deploying selectively. So there's still very much a barbell within fixed income allocations where you still see a lot of short duration. I think people feel okay about the equity market given how well it's done. But in terms right. of diversification, you're definitely seeing people asking a lot more uh, questions about alternatives and where to supplement some of these outcomes. How far out is long duration? I mean, you say short duration. I have no idea. What, is that five years, seven? Is that the belly of the curve? I mean, where, where is short duration besides LIBOR three months? I think people have been thinking more around the two year, two maybe year. Th two, okay. three years, and intermediate is really five to seven. People have not really been <clears throat> thinking much about beyond that for, for the time but being. But we love to, we're guilty. You and I, you're the worst. I'm awful. We're guilty of this because we're quoting a 30 year bond. We're all going <laughs> Nobody's oh, buying it. Nobody everyone. owns Basically, it. <laughs> exactly. Which is like quoting the 100 year Austria piece. Uh, Vera, you know, you raised a great point where you said it's telling that some of these corporate executives are coming on and they're talking about macro risks rather than we're a little concerned that we might see a bit of a softer demand in this 
particular sector of our business, which raises the question, do they just see dynamism as far as the eye can see and they don't necessarily want to uh, get ahead of their skis? Is there kind of a binary outcome where you get bonds underperforming and stocks outperforming? You either have that or you have stocks underperforming and bonds outperforming, and it's one or the other based on the idea that the only thing that could drive bond yields lower is a true full-blown recession that nobody is looking for right now. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like a very much a binary outcome at this point, which from an investor standpoint is helpful from how we construct portfolios, thinking about being diversified between stocks and bonds and sort of that yin and yang in terms of how they typically operate. So as much as people are saying diversification is falling apart, I do think the bigger driver of that was we had an inflation spike, we had all of these Fed hikes, as the Fed is very much moving from power to finesse on the rate hiking cycle and really getting towards the finish line, that dynamic is going to be less prevalent in the new year, but it, it will be a bit of a tug of war. And that's what we're seeing now, challenge in the bond market, success in the, in the equity market relatively. How much is a new hedge oil? And I ask this at a time of great geopolitical uncertainty and, and conflict. There is this feeling that whatever happens, oil prices and oil equities seem to be the big winner of this year. Are you leaning into that? We are leaning into the energy side of that trade. Certainly what we're seeing from a profit standpoint is that is helping energy companies. And ultimately, there are some structural underpinnings of this in terms of underinvestment in, term, in terms of some of the capex and the, the supply factors uh, that we're seeing within the energy space within the U.S. and globally. Uh -huh. and, and I think if we look more broadly as well, I point to what one thing Chair Powell mentioned yesterday, which was, are we headed for an era of more supply shocks? Is this kind of the pandemic aftershock that we're getting over? Or is this a new structural era where supply shocks yeah. play in more than demand? Interesting. I love in your note, you have a single sentence. It's about companies. You're going right back. There's a book none of you have read, Graham, Graham Dodd and Cottle, folks. Sold a few copies. We're going right back to securities analysis, aren't we? Like pick a stock. Absolutely. I mean, look at earnings so far. You've had a, a small number of banks report, a small number of tech companies report, and some pretty divergent outcomes there. And it's very much what are companies doing specifically to manage see their headwinds. See how she finessed that? Do you see how she just finessed the divergent outcome of banks? You know, being at Fortress Diamond, she just finessed that perfectly. You're going to try to put her on the spot and make her uncomfortable. Mira, thank you so much. I'm not going to let you have <laughs> that sort of fall. Mira Pandit, Let's who I really, like, who I really like, and so I don't want you to okay. go there and put her on the spot with something she can't answer or speak to. Chart of the thank day, you. I saw it out on Twitter, and we're not going to get Mira into this because she's going to end up no. in the diamond timeout chair. Although it's but, but the But the answer is the singular message of this week of bank earnings is whether they planned it or not, the continued dominance of one bank in America over the next five or six. There's a bigger trend here, and I think that this is going to be one of the legacies of this period of time, and there's been a bit of research written about this, which is the bigger the company, the more power they have to, adju uh, to adjust to yeah. inflation <clears throat> and to well. economies of scale. And in a period of transition, the bigger getting bigger. And I think you're yeah. seeing that across industries, and I think that what you see in the earnings is those that have the pricing power are the biggest names that are established and able to go around and trim things here, trim things there, and still produce I'll profits. go with the pricing power angle, but I would just say, and there's a fancy word for this, monopsonistic tendencies, which under stress read a 10-year real rate of 2.5%. The haves are getting heavier, and the have-nots are not. And frankly, Powell addressed that with David Weston uh, yesterday. Which raises the question why we haven't seen some more regional bank consolidation. Just to bring this full circle back to Herman Chan, why we haven't seen more consolidation if that is going to create a right. more diversified, robust financial Bramo system. teasing up November and into Q4 there with the regional uh, banks. It's been a more difficult tape the last 20 minutes. Futures at negative 13, S&P futures down three-tenths of a percent. You mentioned that it's been a more difficult tape, but it's come on the heels of bond yields climbing to new post-2007 highs in the U.S. on the longest end. Again, though, this raises this question, who is selling and who is buying, right? I mean, is this something that is mass liquidations, or is this on the margins the new price setters are not the price-insensitive buyers of the Bank of Japan and, and other Japanese investors and, frankly, the People's Bank of China? Do we get full disinversion by the middle of next week? We could. I mean, I mean that's where we're... Uh, handling and folks, there's sort of a not a belief, but maybe a theory that the stress in the system is not the inversion down, as say Priya Misra talked up. Uh, so, uh, which bank is she at this week? JP Morgan. Oh, I didn't know that. And then you know you come up and you disinvert, and the speed of the disinversion here 
uh, uh, I've never seen Lisa. I've this is something people it. are trying to wrap their head around, and it was quite clear <clears throat> to me yesterday that Chair Powell yeah. didn't have a clear read on it either. He did talk about Ooh, the deficit. Harsh. No, it's not harsh. It's just reality. I mean, this is a confusing moment. Nobody knows exactly how much of each factor is driving the bond yields rising and how sticky this is. I think that is the core thing, is that, yes, all of these things are factors. Bigger deficit, buyers yeah. pulling back, this question around inflation and growth. How much each of them is a factor? Unclear. Look at that. You just you alone disinverted. Now we're under 16 basis points on the uh, disinversion of the vanilla two tenths spread. That's a lot of. You knew where there. Priya was, you know, by the way. I, I, you well, totally I, do. You know, the brain fails on a Friday. What am I focused on? How about yen? 149.95. For those of you global, important. Coming up, a fiery essay in the Telegraph. John Bolton, former National Security Advisor. I think the American people are thirsty for change. I think they are hungry for leadership. And frankly, they know that the White House can't provide it. They know the Senate won't lead. And they are looking for House Republicans to step up and lead and make change on these important issues. Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio earlier this hour talking about his additional bids for becoming the House Speaker. A fractious time in Washington, D.C., a fractious time geopolitically, a fractious time in markets. Uh, and I do just, uh, Tom, want to touch on this idea that there is a real angst setting in about the lack of cohesion in Washington, D.C. at yes, a time yes. of incredible uncertainty geopolitically and fiscally for the United States. And it's really been emphasized through the show this morning. I mean, a number of conversations. Greg Villiers, the congresswoman from Michigan, is, is well, you know, we read it in the headlines, but it's one thing to hear the people inside the beltway and the tone of their voices is, is a little bit different. It's troubling to come to some sort of resolution and be able to pass some sort of uh, package at a time where the House does not have a speaker. Just quickly, I do want to run you through sure. what's going on in markets because you are seeing a softening in the tape as you see bond yields climbing. <clears throat> Although off the earlier highs, you are seeing 10-year yields, though, just close to where they uh, closed yesterday, up near 4.99%, 4.97%, just a touch lower this morning. But S&P futures hanging in there, down three-tenths of a percent. But, Tom, I think that that to me is a story only down three tenths of a percent at a time where oil prices are climbing right. and bond yields are surging to the highest since 2007. It seems ages ago, but we count it in days where team surveillance said we're going to speak to people with experience. We had a screaming eagle of the uh, 101st Airborne with us, I believe, yesterday. We had a Marine of Fallujah with us a few days ago. And now on the political front, we have someone controversial, opinionated, whether you agree or disagree with John Bolton, read his Telegraph article, which sets up the region and Iran as we look at a fractured Eastern Mediterranean. He's a former United States ambassador to the United Nations, former national security advisor, and a fractious relationship with President Trump. Ambassador Bolton, thank you so much for joining Bloomberg uh, today. Glad I'm not, to be with you. I'm not going to mince words, John. You go back to an internship with a guy named Spiro T. Agnew. You have seen it all. How is this different from 1967 and 1973? Well, I think in Washington, uh, we really are suffering from an acute lack of leadership and, and by a lot of people who forget that they were sent here not to represent themselves, but to represent the country. You know, you remember back in the, in the, in the British Parliament in, in uh, World War II when the labor leader got up after one of uh, Neville Chamberlain's acts of appeasement and said he was there to speak for the labor leader who was not around. And Leo Amory, a conservative MP, got up and said, speak for England. And what we need people in Washington to be doing is speaking for America, and sadly, they're not. To look back with 2020 vision, how did we get here within the administration that you served in recently, the Trump administration? Do we have these evil and difficult events because we were off the watch one and three and five years ago? Yeah, look, I, I think we have failed to see what's been happening uh, in, in the Middle East coherently for close to 20 years now. And I think at the root of it, the principal threat to peace and security in the Middle East today and for some years back has been Iran. Uh, in, in the current circumstance, 
Uh, they're the ones who have armed and trained and equipped and financed Hamas. They've done the same with Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They've done the same with Hezbollah. They've done the same with the Syrian military. And remember just yesterday, demonstrating again, they've done it with the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Uh, a U.S. destroyer in the Red Sea destroyed several cruise missiles and I think some drones heading north uh, in the Red Sea, probably toward Israel. So the Houthis wouldn't have two rocks to rub together if it weren't for the equipment Iran has given them. Iran is the central factor here. And last night, the president's address, which was fine as far as it went, did not address that crucial point. How can you have a strategy if you don't know what the main threat is? Who's more vulnerable right now, Iran or Israel? Well, I think at the moment it's uh, it's Israel, but I think Israel's perfectly equipped to deal with this on their own. And I, I hope I hope they haven't lost the, the spirit they once had, which is they will defend themselves. They can do it alone. Uh, they can use weapons, but they don't expect anybody else to come and fight their battles for them, or, nor do they expect to take direction from anybody else either. And I do think there's something to the argument that that a uh, bear hug that uh, President Biden gave Bibi Netanyahu was not just affection, but an effort to uh, insert himself into Israeli decision making. Frankly, I'd rather have Netanyahu make the decisions than Biden. If you're faced with a threat like we've seen in Hamas and, and the deeper threat, the real threat from Iran, you know, you can live with it for a long time until you die from it. And uh, and that's why I think the government of Israel and I think even more than that, perhaps the people of Israel intend to see the Hamas threat eliminated in the Gaza Strip. A lot of people are saying that one of the big sticking points for the U.S. going more aggressively after Iran right now is, A, it would cause an even bigger conflagration, and putting that genie back in the bottle is very difficult. B, you have a population in Iran that actually supports the United States and Israel to a large degree and doesn't necessarily agree with the, uh, the government positions. And number three, oil prices would surge, and that would be a problem for the global economy. How important is that third factor to take into consideration? Look, I think the concern the White House has for, for rising oil prices is in the United States. They're worried about November of next year. That's why they signed this, this, uh, this atrocious agreement with uh, Maduro in Venezuela to pretend that he's going to have free elections uh, and, and to allow U.S. sanctions on the export of Venezuelan oil to disappear. I think they're desperate not to uh, have oil prices go up. The easy way, of course, would be to allow more oil production in the United States, but they don't want to do that mm -hmm. because if the oil industry here got stronger, it would be harder to dismantle for their green agenda. The, the, the real question is, do you want to deal with the threat from Iran or do you want to pretend that it doesn't exist? The administration... Uh, has gone out of its way right. to pretend that it doesn't exist, including uh, its chief Iran negotiator, Rob Malley, being sus having his security clearance suspended in April by the State Department's uh, Diplomatic Security Bureau. The, the chief negotiator under security investigation. Right. It's just unbelievable. John, my book of the year is Robert D. Kaplan's The Loom of Time, which stretches from Morocco all the way over to Persia. And the answer here, Ambassador Bolton, is we have to carve out a relationship with friends within the Middle East. How do we prosecute a new strategy with Sunni Saudi Arabia versus Shia Iran, which you consider to be our major threat? Well, I think the threat is the regime in Iran. I, I don't have any quarrel with the Iranian people. We, we've had good relations with them before. And I think one reason uh, that Iran took this opportunity now, and coincidentally, the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, is they were very worried that the strategic closeness between the Gulf Arab states in particular and Israel uh, might be reaching a point where they could no longer affect it. So that this for them, for Iran, uh, for the mullahs in Tehran was a critical moment to act. I think things were moving in the right direction. In fact, I think if you ask the Gulf Arabs, uh, they have greater faith in Israel's strategic right. vision of the region than they do with the United States. John Bolton, one final question. What is the new isolationism of America? We want to run from this to a great extent. That's what the polling says. There's certain domestic tensions. Are we isolationist as we await for this war? Not yet, but there are two factors causing it. One is Donald Trump, uh, and I think he's had a, a pervasive effect, sad to say, in the Republican Party. The second is, for many years, our politicians have not 
treated our citizens like adults and told them what the threats are that we face in the world. I think if you talk to citizens uh, like they're, they're, they are adults, they'll understand the threat. They'll do what we've always done as Americans and find ways to defend ourselves. If you act like the rest of the world doesn't matter, when suddenly find that it does, it's no wonder people are surprised if their leaders have been negligent. John Bolton, thank you for joining Bloomberg Surveillance this morning. Ambassador Bolton, a former national security advisor. Lisa, this is just a dose of real politic. And as you know, Mr. Bolton is very controversial. But the idea here of, of, of Blinken doing shuttle diplomacy, what is our diplomacy? What is our theory right now forward in terms of real politic versus a different approach that Bolton was critical of? One of the biggest problems right now is the confusion between parsing out regimes from the population, from the civilians. And this is one of the most difficult aspects of all of this. How do you separate out a leader or a group, whether it's Hamas, whether it's the Iranian right. leadership, from population that are just comprised of innocent civilians? Continued coverage here through the day. Look for balance of power this evening. Joe Matthew and Anne-Marie Horton as well. In the next hour, on the bond market, the 30-year British bond is back to 1998 levels. Mohammed El Aryan recalls that. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.